speaking time at the start of the hearing on that item, plus up to two minutes at the conclusion of that hearing. All other persons wishing to speak on agenda items are limited to three minutes per person. However, if they feel that it is needed and justified, the chairman may extend these times by up to two minutes. All speakers are requested to state his or her name and address for the record when beginning to speak. When you are finished speaking, please share your name, address, and the case number on the sheet provided in the room. This will enable staff to notify you if there are any additional proceedings concerning that item. All speakers at the podium, please remove your face mask before speaking into the microphone. Please note that all written and visual materials you present to the commission and the board will be retained by the secretary as part of the official record. If you are not speaking, but you wish to be notified about future proceedings on a particular case, please provide your contact information to the planning department. The Planning Commission and the Board are interested in hearing the views of all persons who wish to express themselves on all the agenda items. However, we ask that all speakers please be as courteous and concise as possible and avoid long repetitions of facts or opinions which have already been stated. For your information, the Wichita City Council has adopted a policy for all city zoning items. A copy of this policy is available from the planning staff. The City Council relies on a written record of the Planning Commission hearings and does not conduct its own additional hearings on these items. The decision of the BZA is final. Any appeal of a decision of the BZA is to the District Court. Thank you. Now I would call for a roll call and I remind Commissioners please microphones so you can be heard by those attending virtually. Thank you. Here. Duel. Here. McKay. Here. Green. Here. Bill Johnson. Here. Blick. Here. Nix. Here. Foster. Here. Warren. Here. Joe Johnson. Mr. Johnson, are you joining virtually? I know I saw him on here. Those people in those little boxes, boy, they can get away from you. <laughs> I'm going to mark him as here because we did see him. We're going to verify that on the system real quick here. I'm here. <laughs> Cindy Miles is here. Hartman? Here. Cunningham? Here. William Spay? Here. And Mr. Joe Johnson is listed on the register uh, online, and we did hear his voice earlier, so I imagine he must have just stepped away from it. I'm moment. here. Thank you. I'm here, Scott. You've received, you. you've received minutes of the November 17th meeting and this morning a, a correction to the first paragraph, which is in front of you. Uh, any further discussion on minutes? Then I'd call for a motion, please, to approve minutes of December 1st. I move for approval. Motion from Commissioner. Second. Second, Commissioner Foster. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, I show absent Joshua Blick. Absent. Uh, and any nays? Motion passes. We are 13 0. 13 0 1. 13 0 1, thank you. Uh, next, we will proceed to a review of the agenda to identify those items that we can take by consent and those which we'll hear. Uh, the first item, 2.1, subdivision 2022 0038 located near 69th Street North and 55th Street West. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone in the chambers want to hear this case? Any member of the public participating virtually want to hear this case? Hearing none, point one on consent. 2.2, subdivision 2022-0061, located near Central and 135th Street West, 
I do want to report I had an ex parte com uh, conversation on this case, but I am still open uh, to hearing all aspects and look forward to testimony. I would like to hear this case. Um, 2.3. Uh, subdivision 2022 0062 located near 37th Street North and Greenwich Road. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Okay, we'll hear 2.3. That ends the committee recommendation items. Motion to approve 2.1. I have a motion from Commissioner Blick. Second. Second, Commissioner Green. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Aye. Opposed, nay. Hearing none, motion passes 13-0. 14-0. We have everybody now. Thank you. We don't have items today, so we'll move to public hearing items. Uh, item 4.1, conditional use 2022 0045 South Hydraulic. We will hear this case because staff is recommending denial. Item 4.2, uh, Community Unit Plan 2022-00052, located near 127th Street East, north of Highway 54. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone? Yeah, I, do. I do. You do? Okay. We'll hear 4.2. Item 4.3, zoning case 2022-00063, located near 63rd Street South and Clifton. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Okay, we all hear 4.3. And item 4.4, .4, zoning case 2022-00064, uh, located at 5727 South Hydraulic. Does anyone on the commission want to hear this case? Anyone... Uh, in chambers want to hear this case? Anyone participating virtually want to hear this case at 5727 South Hydraulic? Hearing none, you, do you want to hear this case? Did you raise your hand? So okay, we will hear 4.4. That takes us back to the subdivision items. We'll begin with 2.2. Uh, I believe our presented. Ah, thank you, Neil. Uh, please provide the staff report for item 2.2. Neil Straw Planning Staff. This is a 89 lot plat. It's located in the northwest corner of Central and 135th Street West. Uh, MAPC two weeks ago approved a plan unit development, and that PUD is scheduled for the Board of County Commissioners review on January 11th. Uh, this plat encompasses the south portion of that PUD. Yeah, right here in the south. Uh, at last week's subdivision meeting, I explained that staff recommended the plat be approved with a fire apparatus access to Central at the west end at Barn Owl Street. Which right there. I think we have a blow up on the next sheet also. Although that opening to Central was through a fire apparatus access on the plat, County Public Works did approve that location for a potential opening for a public street. Uh, staff also requested a street stub connection to the west to provide access for future development per the subdivision regulations. Uh, the agents spoke last week, and they objected to the street stub to the west uh, for floodplain. Re we j there we go. No, nope, we just had a. There we go for floodplain reasons. Uh, basically, saying that uh, this is floodway, this is a floodplain, so there is a minimal area to develop. Uh, 
Uh, they said that if they were required to put in a connection to the west, that it be a contingent dedication only and not a full public right of way. The agent wanted to keep the plat as a single point of access with access on the east side right here, this location off of Central. And they wanted that for residents for security reasons. Uh, the subdivision committee last week focused on concerns. Uh, since the plat showed only one access for the residents, this long east-west street, uh, there was concern that emergency an emergency or blockage along that street would be problematic, particularly with residents for medical or other reasons. Uh, the subdivision discussed the of a connection to the west to avoid another opening from central we have at this plat right here. Uh, there was also a neighbor speaking last week uh, from Highland Springs Development to the south. They objected to the plat, uh, saying it was not compatible with the neighborhood uh, due to reasons of traffic congestion, uh, drainage issues, density, and also architectural design. If we could go back to the overall. Okay, there we go. Uh, after further discussion by the subdivision committee, there was a motion that included a full access point at Barn Owl Street right here. That would be a public right of way connection to Central and no street stub to the west. There was a substitute motion that included a fire access to Central at this location, per the revised plat, and a contingent dedication to the West. There was another substitute motion followed, and that motion was voted on. Uh, this motion included a stub street to the West, and that'd be a full public right of way. That would be in accordance with the subdivision regulations and also access, I'm sorry, also fire access to Central at Barnall per road. That motion four to three. If we could have the next slide showing the blow up, it might be a little bit easier. There we go. Uh, and that motion was fire access to central per the fire code, stub to the west per the subdivision regulations. That motion failed four to three. <clears throat> there was a follow up motion. This motion was approved. This motion included a full access point at Barnow, extending to Central, again, a full public right of way. This would give the plat two access points, in addition to requiring a street to the west. That motion approved six to one. I should also add, we do have the assistant city manager uh, here today, Troy Anderson, he would also like to address the uh, subdivision committee. Are you ready for Troy, Neil? Yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Troy Anderson, assistant city manager, city of Wichita. Uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to come out today and say a few words. I uh, wanted to uh, talk to you all a little bit today about uh, where we're at and some of the conversations that we're having. Uh, I want to make the distinction sort of first and foremost that um, we are not here to advocate 
on behalf of or against the subdivi subdivision committee. Uh, we're not here to uh, support or condone that recommendation or, or any action coming out of the, the planning commission here today. Uh, what I would like to say, though, is that um, it's my understanding that we've been talking about subdivision access for um, several years now as a community, um, trying to understand better what it is that we're trying to accomplish, how are we trying to respond to safety and security of the residents uh, within these subdivisions, uh, as, as well as access as it relates to emergency responders, um, access as it relates to uh, uh, traffic engineering models, and, and additionally connectivity from just a community perspective. So with that being said, we have uh, convened group of folks representing uh, a whole host of city departments. Uh, we are starting to gather a lot of our current codes and ordinances, um, and we're in the process right now of evaluating those. Uh, one of our primary goals and objectives is ultimately to um, make sure that all of those codes um, are achieving the same desired results, right? Uh, and so over the next couple of weeks, our goal is to uh, compare those to what we might identify as sort of best, best practices um, as it relates to subdivision access, uh, access controls, security, those kind of things. Uh, and then we want to be able to bring those uh, recommendations back to the subdivision community, community and stakeholder input and engagement. Ultimately, I think what we're going to look for at the end of the day is, is what is a best fit for Wichita. We know and understand uh, the opportunities out there for uh, trying to collaborate with our development community and uh, we want to achieve a standard that in the best interest of everybody involved. So uh, with that, that's where we're at in the process. We have a group. We are beginning to dive into our uh, uh, local codes and ordinances to try to understand what we have available to us today where there's opportunities for improvement um, and then again in the very near future, we're hoping first quarter of next year, probably mid-January, I'd like to try and circle that group up with some recommendations, bring it before the subdivision committee as well as ultimately this body here uh, to try and establish uh, a best fit for everybody. And so with that, I'm available for questioning. Questions, uh, Commissioner? So just based on what you said, you have specific recommendations or concerns about what's been done on this particular, I mean, you're speaking in generalized terms, but do you have specific recommendations for what we have up here on the board right now? So again, I, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm standing here, again, not advocating for or against the recommendation of the subdivision committee. You all have to weigh that um, and the recommendation and approval or, or denial of that yourself. I, I'm simply here to let you know that we do know and understand uh, on both sides of the spectrum the, the issues that exist surrounding uh, secondary means of access, whether that be for the purposes of safety and security of the residents involved in the subdivision, whether that means uh, the, the access for emergency responders uh, and otherwise. So we are having unfortunately, I I don't have a recommendation for you here today. That's why, uh, obviously, you're going to have to rely on um, the recommendation of the subdivision committee, uh, as well as input here today from those folks here in the audience, uh, and make a, a, a recommendation and decision on your own. Again, I'm just trying to hear to let you know where we're at in the process. We understand there are some concerns and issues about this citywide, and we're hoping to respond to those in the very near future. Unfortunately, I, I don't have a recommendation for you today. Uh, did that answer your question, Commissioner Nix? Kind of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if this were happening, say, in the future, in the next two, three months, would we have some clearer direction for those of us who serve the division committee? Is that what you're saying? I, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm saying that um, over the course of the next couple of weeks and months, we're hoping to get to an understanding of today, what might exist out there nationwide is best practice, but we know and understand that best practice may not be appropriate for Wichita. And so with input from our stakeholders, our developers, our residents, we want to get to a best fit. And where we may land on that best fit is an emergency access, or that best fit may be 
a secondary full movement intersection. You're right, we don't know where that's going to land, but we are in the process. Unfortunately, I know that makes it difficult for you all today and in the very near future to act on these. Um, you know, we have guidance and rules and regulations in place for you to to make those decisions on today, but I, I want you to know and understand that we are listening to the community. We are hearing some of the feedback from the community on some of these issues, um, and we're hoping to try to resolve those in the near future. Other questions from commissioners? Virtual? Yes, I have one. Go ahead, one. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes, when you say stakeholders and residents, are you going to have any residents of people who live in a community where there's um, a locked gate because we've heard that sometimes those aren't kept up very well and I'd like to know what the status of that really is. Yes, I think that over the course of the next couple of weeks and months we'll be able to further identify who those community stakeholders and residents are. We're certainly open to suggestion as to uh, areas of the community specific subdivisions, resident, et cetera. We'd, we'd love to get that feedback. Yes. Okay, thank you. Could you um, just make, I want to make sure I understand a fire apparatus access opening and how exactly that operates, who can get through it, when they can get through it, and how they get through it. Yeah, I know we have the fire marshal here today. He might be able to better respond to that than I do, than I can. Could we have the fire marshal come forward now to answer that question? Is that a fair process? Oh, I get to decide. Uh, so I'm Chris Dugan. I'm the fire marshal here for the Wichita Fire Department. Um, and when we talk about fire apparatus access, the code is very specific that it is, as the code is written, it is intended for fire apparatus and fire department personnel to gain entry into the community um, to perform emer emergency services. Um, we do allow gates. We do allow a variety of locking mechanisms on those gates. Um, we require the access point to be well marked. We require it to be surfaced in accordance with the code. Um, and then there's also a width requirement of 20 feet, generally. Um, but as far as, as emergency access or citizen egress, uh, the code is, is silent, unfortunately. So I think that's where Mr. Anderson um, is going. We, we need to get more stakeholders together, get everybody in the room, and then come to a consensus. Okay. A question, Commissioner Green? So uh, specifically, only fire would have access to these fire apparatus roads correct per the code and i'm yeah. only speaking from you know police fire code police um, ambulance residents right would not have how access to those secure. locks on the gates right it's our fire code is only only concerned with fire apparatus access commissioner foster and our understanding is there's no at current currently no ongoing inspection process so and that if is somebody that changes our, the lock and doesn't tell you. Right. That's something that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think we should work with the subdivision committee um, and several several city departments and staff to make sure these access points are maintained and well marked um, and use going forward. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Warren. Yeah, are you familiar with the, the plan that we're looking at today? Have you yes, looked sir. that over? Mm -hmm. My question would be, uh, if you, you came upon a fire in this neighborhood, would you use the fire access first, or first and foremost, or would you attempt to use the, the main entrance into the So we would attempt first? to use the main entrance. Um, the apparatus access would be more for if there's, say there's an emergency, a tornado, maybe there's a giant tree across the main entrance, then we would look to use the fire apparatus access. In a plat like this, would you see a significant time variance if I'm, if your mother or me are living in the furthest home from the point of entry, mm -hmm. is that a significant time difference for response that would potentially result in loss of life or property? Or how significant is that? Or how do you judge? The primary versus the fire apparatus access? Mm -hmm. It's, I can't, I guess I can't. I don't want to answer to hypotheticals. Yeah. Um, okay. I will say 
strictly for our access, I don't have a problem with this plat as, as okay. presented. If there's additional concerns, um, I've heard safety um, discussed several times. I'm not saying that there, there may be safety concerns. The planning commission or subdivision committee uh, takes into consideration. But as far as from a fire code official's perspective, I, um, I would approve this plat. Okay. And ambulances don't come with fire. Right. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. you. Any other questions for the fire marshal? All right. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission for Troy or Neil on this case before we proceed to public comment? Well, Commissioner Green? Um, I, I guess at this point, I would probably like to have the, the fire marshal back up. I didn't realize that oh, we're kind of doing sorry. this out of, kind of out of sequence. And, and so I don't, for, we're at staff, I guess the staff presentation at this point, that's okay. Uh, so I, I guess my question would be on our staff got um, uh, it was the fire apparatus access road was not going to be approved um, and then a week uh, later at our subdivision meeting the fire apparatus access road was approved mm -hmm. uh, what what happened in in between the time that the report was written and the time that we, was presented to us uh, at the division so Sure. So Chief O'Kady's uh, met with, I believe, Mr. Gish was the MKC rep. Um, they came up with a with sort of a compromise to require an electric gate opener, I believe, with uh, the citizens could operate it from the inside. Um, that requirement, um, while I would be, be fully supportive of it, it is not mandated by the code. The code gives several options, including padlocks, including Knox boxes. Um, SOS operated siren electric gates are an option, but they're not required. And I guess at, at this point, I don't feel comfortable with, from my perspective, um, issuing mandates or, or guidance that go in addition to the code. I'm all for following the code as written. But to me, when we when we step beyond um, the purview of the code, then then I guess our um, opinions come in come into play and I don't like basing our decisions off of our opinions I would rather use the code as written yep. I, I guess what what it comes down to me though uh, for is uh, when when we're concerned about security and I fully uh, appreciate the security uh, aspect of the subdivisions um, but more importantly for me I, I, I see the safety of the residents in, in these subdivisions and if if there is something that's that's blocking the main uh, access road into a subdivision the people that live in the subdivision have no way of getting out the fire apparatus access road if it has been accessed then they might have a, a, a way to get out but if that fire apparatus access road has not been uh, opened or activated in in use, then those residents in that neighborhood are unable to uh, get out, um, and they're basically landlocked. And uh, you even mentioned the uh, ambulance and police, and they don't have access to those fire apparatus access roads. Do um, uh, any other com or questions for our staff? giving the report and fire marshal who are present. Commissioner Blick. I just have a question. So the international fire code right now, what, what version are we using for? The 2018. The 2018 yes, sir. and the state uses? They are 2018 as well. Are they? Okay. Yep. Okay, additional questions. All right, then we will proceed to public comment on this Madam item. Madam Chair, I'm sorry, you need to go Did to I for, the applicant. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, Neil. The applicant or agent, please come forward. Good Lord. Like I said, ho, ho, ho. Um, oh, Neil, do you have additional information to present? He does not. All right. This is our applicant or agent, and you will please give us your name and address, and you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Certainly, yes. Uh, good afternoon, Jason Gish. Uh, MKEC Engineering, uh, representing the applicant here. Um, I guess uh, just wanted to focus a little bit 
the whole premise of Western civilization having legal historical precedents. And in our perspective, and trying to design subdivisions for our uh, developer friends, um, they give us the program of what they have, and then we go to work and try to evaluate the land and what the land um, affords us as opportunities, and um, we come up with a design. And in this particular instance, um, you can see what we came up with. Uh, this subdivision here is intended to be a, an EPCON community, and this will be the sixth one within the city of Wichita. Um, I brought along a board that I'm going to show you that shows some of the design standards and codes that we've been following throughout. So to, to our knowledge, we've met all the subdivision regs and codes per as they are written. And uh, so I guess in our perspective, we feel uh, the, the, the prior subdivision recommendation um, doesn't reflect what's been approved legally and historically before. So I'm going to put up a board, but there's three subdivisions I want to show you. One of them is um, Auburn Hills. That was the very first one. Uh, another one is Auburn Lakes, which is actually right across the road. And these are very near this project, only a mile and a half or two away. And then uh, the third one um, is called Courtyards at Brookfield, and that one is out east. You did stay close to the microphone, if you will, Jason, so the folks online can hear you. And I don't know, we we don't have a camera that can zoom in on the you want to display. Perfect. That's right. Sure. So um, what I basically want to indicate is there's just some basic information listed on here. You'll see uh, a magenta circle and a green circle. Um, I believe it's the magenta circle that represents the primary entrance to each one of these subdivisions. Each one of these subdivisions, I should note, has significantly more lots or slightly more lots than the current uh, plat you're looking at. And in each one of these instances or these examples, there's one primary entrance. And then we have either multiple or uh, a single secondary entrance uh, that is an emergency access as platted. Uh, working with staff and fire, we're recommending that they recommend that we change that a little bit to call it a fire apparatus road. So we're just kind of changing the definition of that. But I just want to point out that to, to our knowledge, see our perspective to this, thinking that we had, uh, for the most part, done everything it's been approved before, and uh, we feel uh, it was unfair um, to all of a sudden have to do something much different when we followed all the rules. Now, I do want to focus on one of the uh, comments that we didn't necessarily have 100% solved at subdivision, and so we came before the subdivision committee and asked about the property to the west, and we are um, in full agreement of trying to always connect into uh, adjacent properties where it makes the best sense. Our, I just want to share the logic that we had of why we, we did not want to connect into the other property. Um, Mr. Strahl showed a, a graphic earlier that you had on your screen, and I have an additional one that could be handed out. But there are three acres of land available to the west. And that three acres, besides being in a different property ownership, happens to be surrounded by a significant floodplain to the north and then a finger uh, with a blue line stream that goes to the south and crosses central. As a land planner, given there's three acres there, um, that acreage is not likely to be, uh, you know, it's just small uh, we have a tree row, a very nice, mature, old tree row that's on the shared property line between these properties. That property already has a, it's a farm road access, if you will, 
into that property, but there's a current access that's on central that feeds that property. And uh, therefore, we just thought that it was realistic that that property could be served solely from central and disconnected. Um, we'd, we'd prefer it that way, um, but you know, if you know, we would like to have further conversation on that. Uh, but that's why we did not have a connection there. And I assume, Jason, that meets all the fire code requirements for the makeup of that road to make, get a fire apparatus in or emergency vehicles in? So as presented on our current plat, we did meet with uh, Chief O'Cadies and we worked through the logistics of that as we've done with all the fire chiefs um, previously. Um, because some of this stuff, we, we are doing some unique things that have not been before. Um, we have a unique product here. It's actually on another subdivision, the courtyards at the moorings, but it's just now uh, it's going to get built here this year or next year rather. But that access as we had it uh, shown as an emergency um, or fire apparatus access, access was there at the far west end and it would have a stub that would tie to central that would meet the fire code with a 20 foot wide gate and uh, or 20 foot with a gate. Um, as far as the concern about people being trapped in the subdivision, I attempted to use my farm boy talents to get out on the subdivision meeting and I have bolt cutters that are in my garage. I could get out, but uh, easier, smarter way is we just would give the combination to all the people that live there in the HOA and they can go over there, roll the combination, unlock the padlock, swing the gates open and drive out if they were stuck in an emergency. Um, for what it's worth, I don't know if that's how rare emergencies are or how prevalent they are, but I do want to just make the show the precedent of why we did what we did and we weren't trying to go against any of the rules. We thought we were following them. And so we would appreciate the opportunity to repeat that until such time there's new rules. With that, I'd stand for questions. Questions for the applicant. Uh, we let reserve those till after public comment at this time. Our commissioners, go ahead, Joshua. Commissioner Blake. I have a question. I seen at the very beginning, we were talking about water um, and floodplain and so forth. So I went ahead and just went into Cedric County's GIS mapping. And when it shows on their mapping, it actually shows that stream that's coming up to the north side, that subdivision. It comes all the way around and goes right back through the whole middle of this subdivision. And then it goes all the way back down to 100 and the next, uh, that subdivision to the south. So it actually goes back west and then it goes back south, but it goes right through the middle. How are you guys going to handle that if the flood zone is going to come down on that west side? If it's going to flood, it's also going to flood all the way back through your whole subdivision. Yeah, so, um, and I, I have, if I, Neil, would you mind helping me here? So I'm just going to hand this out just because I'm going to define two things. Thank you. So you're correct. There's, there's two things kind of going on. There's a flood way uh, as defined by FEMA, and that's the a pink line on the handout that you're going to see. Um, the simple way I think about that is, is uh, that's the point where, where it becomes very difficult to put fill across a flood way. The, the blue represents the 100-year floodplain as defined by FEMA and mapped by FEMA. As you can see, there is a finger that's probably, my guess, in, in the backwater of this significant tributary. It's, it's backing up across central. That said, however, that floodplain that you see, that's a fairly good-sized stream. It's a blue line stream um, as defined by USGS and probably Wildlife and Parks, those folks, that comes across central. Um, so I just wanted to make the point that, that there is a very small tract of land there. It's three acres in size. You can see it in the scale of that quarter section and, and the adjacent plat that we are um, submitting before you. Does that help answer the? It sure does. And if you see that little red triangle that you 
that you're representing. If you go to the property to the south, you can see the squiggly line. That line actually came from all the way into the middle of that subdivision, all the way from 135th that it's shown on uh, the GIS mapping. So on the original map that's shown on the, on the front cover right here, if you look right in the middle of your subdivision, it kind of goes really light where it says, it says 4th Street North, right above that you can see it really light. It actually carries all the way through the middle of the subdivision and then goes on the photo you presented, it goes all the way back into this field over here. So there's, there's actually some additional flooding, it looks like, and for what it's showing on the GIS mapping. I mean, you can see it in the field right there. You can see the little squiggly that's coming down. That actually comes from all the way from 135th right through the middle of your subdivision. So you have the whole top side, then it comes right back through the middle and then goes down south. Okay, I, I guess I'm not probably understanding what the, yeah, we, well, for, for the most part, um, so we, so this uh, applicant owns the entire quarter section that the current plat resides on. Um, there'll be more of this same product. That's, that's what they're proposing to do. Most of the subdivisions that are the courtyards, uh, the EPCON communities, most of them have um, where we can over 100 lots. So what we're doing the south piece for is because we're trying to break it up so that we can get lots on the ground. Uh, the courtyards at Auburn Lakes has gone very well for the developer. They're thankful about that. Um, and so they're out of lots. And so we're kind of pushing forward quickly to give you a little background on why we presented the, just the south half. But to go across to the north half, uh, at the subdivision, I kind of presented a bigger picture. This community will be tied. Their, their major amenities, the, the clubhouse, um, a lot of those features will be to the north. They also have their own to the south, but um, the contemplation is there'll be a pedestrian bridge that this neighborhood can get over to enjoy the amenities, the courtyard um, that will be on the north side that will come before you hopefully soon. And... Um, but to cross that with a vehicular uh, crossing, um, it's millions of dollars to cross that floodway. And so it doesn't very well pencil out. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but we, we're trying to respect the floodplain. It's kind of difficult um, unless there's some really easy areas to fill. It's, it's difficult to go through the process sometimes of filling in a floodplain especially on a on a residential type market okay uh commissioner foster jason is the entrance to the east a gated entrance is this to be a gated community is that the idea no no it's not intended to be a gated community um you mentioned uh, I, that's one thing i thought about asking him and we We've had the opportunity to work on several gated or private right-of-way communities within the city. And, um, you know, there's, there's several in the city, and they all work within the fire code as well. So gated communities are not necessarily unusual. They're not restricted, to my knowledge, within the subdivision regs. They just have a little bit different long-term maintenance requirements and, and such with public works in the city. I guess what I'm getting at is if it's not a gated community and we're already postulating a, a gate on the west end that all the members, all the residents will have a key or a, a code to the to the lock. So the the sense of security that is being marketed is basically all marketing. I mean it's not gated community. It is open, whether it's open with one entrance or two entrances, just a psychological difference. There's, there's two things. So I'm going to talk about the code first. So if it was a gated entrance, the whole community was gated, the uh, maintenance of that street would be the responsibility of the development itself. 
Um, the EPCON community and, and what they do is not set up that way. Uh, they, they utilize a public street system, which then uh, is paid for initially through special assessments by the buyers. And then ongoing is maintained by the city at large. Um, that's my understanding. So uh, that's the reason that it's open. The, the second reason, um, and this is purely based on the hundreds and hundreds of homes that are in the Wichita market, if this same product, the buyers of these communities are typically a 55 plus buyer. Um, they are very concerned about security in their neighborhood because they're buying this property because it's maintenance, maintenance is all provided for. And so a lot of these folks um, are retirement age and such, so they have an opportunity to travel perhaps or be gone. It's a sense of security. We all know that if there's one way in and out of something, you know you can watch one entrance uh, easier than you can watch two. So there is real merit in uh, both the physical aspect of it and in the minds of people that a single entrance is a safer community. Okay, well, just so you know what's going through the back of my mind, to me, it's more marketing, and I understand marketing matters, marketing affects costs, but it's there's no there there, whereas the safety issue is a real issue, and having one full public access as opposed to two full public access to me is safer, and the psychology of feeling more secure isn't as real as the actual safety issues. That's how I'm thinking about it. Certain quest additional questions for the applicant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, could you uh, go back just a little bit to the uh, uh, the stub to the west and and the potential development uh, to the west um, and uh, explain the. Explain the difference between developing in a flood plain and a flood way. If you notice on, if you notice on the flood floodway maps, the FEMA maps, the flood plain actually goes up, um, or the flood way, excuse me, the flood way actually veers up to the north, and it's flood plain that comes down to the south. Is it? Possible to develop in floodplain areas and not floodway areas? You, you can develop in both. Um, all I wanted to make the point of is in a residential market, it's, it's kind of cost prohibitive to do a bunch of work down there. Plus, in a residential development, and if you go look at any of the prior EPCON communities, we, we work really hard with the developer to keep every asset that we have um, on the development. So um, Auburn Lakes is like a perfect example. Could have gone in there and radically changed that floodplain, but it was important. And yes, it maybe lost several lots to do so, but at the same time, there's a balance of not spending additional dollars to go in and, and do work in the floodplain, but, but mostly aesthetically, it's, uh, it's an asset to the community and it's why the communities can be popular. Uh, my second question would be um, uh, the county approved uh, access controls on central, one for the, the main entrance into the subdivision, and they said that they would approve a second access at the west end if it was not a fire apparatus access road. I think that's what I saw in the in the reply. Yeah, I'm getting an, an affirmation over there from the county engineer, um, which leads into my last point, at least at this point. Um, today was the first day that we heard any mention whatsoever of a gate with a code that the residents would be able 
to use in case of an emergency. Um, I, that's, that brings an, an entirely different uh, and important piece of information to this, uh, this whole plat. Um, if in fact there was a way for, from a safety standpoint, for the residents to be able to get out of the subdivision in case the main and only access point in there is blocked. Okay. Other questions for our commissioner or for our applicant? All right, hearing none, we will give you an opportunity for rebuttal after we listen through public comment now on this case. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so those of you who are in the room who would like to comment on this case, just start lining up at the front. We'll have you give your name and address, please, for the record, and then each of you will have three minutes to uh, speak to us on your perspective. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just line up. That just gets us a little speedier for you in line and ready to go. First off, my apologies for my attire. Um, I was on a very compressed time schedule today because this is not supposed to happen. And uh, I would also um, re respectfully request a minute uh, in addition time uh, to read through my prepared statement. Your name and address, please, yes, for the record. Clint Stevens, 13608 West Hartner, Wichita 67235. I'm the uh, Highland Springs HOA president and speaking on behalf of the HOA and all the residents that we have. Yeah, I would grant you the full five minutes, but please get under that if you can with your presentation. Thanks for preparing in advance. Yes, ma'am. Thank you okay. very much. Um, we're not here to, uh, to challenge the product that the, uh, the developer and the applicant proposed because we know that they do good work and the other areas that they have um, are well done. That is not our purpose. We are, we are challenging and, and raising concerns based on the location of what they're wanting to build. Um, so good afternoon and thank you again for the opportunity to present to you all. Each step of this process has identified and highlighted additional issues that need addressed to a certain level of satisfaction that is yet to be achieved. This property has two parcels where the developer has only provided information on parcel one, the proposed plat, and when questioned in previous hearings about parcel two the, to the north, the developer's agents has stated it will most, mostly be single family and maybe multifamily. The lack of specifics on the entire development and the impact each parcel has on the other and existing developed areas remains unknown. Parcel one is proposed to have a three to one dwelling to acre ratio with a realized ratio of closer to six to one as you've seen on their plat. The size and location does not lend to their stated $550,000 to $650,000 price tag with 78 compact lots of 4,000 square feet, six foot spacing between structures, 12 to 1,500 uh, main level square feet, no basements and zero yard as they've proposed uh, previously. When comparing to Auburn Hills and Estancia, which was mentioned today, where those homes are selling between 350 and 500,000, those lots are a third larger on average bigger homes with yards. Uh, Auburn Hills and Lakes has a golf course and other lake amenities. Estancia has a very large commercial presence and uh, where this product will have ne neither of those. Parcel two is proposed to have a five to one dwelling to acre ratio with a realized ratio yet to be seen as no specifics have been provided. The information presented to you in relation to parcel one is misleading, forward looking at best and impact based on the total development is completely unknown. This property in its entirety is split by the floodplain, which we've talked about, which is of great concern to us current residents and the future residents that will live there. There's already been expansive damage from flooding as it's been experienced in the past more than once. And this proposal effectively requests more than 50 acres of concrete to be placed immediately adjacent south of the floodplain without retention reservoirs, nor a proposed plan to maintain or reduce current runoff as required by regulation. When asked, the developer stated, we have regulations to follow, but yet no plan has been presented. 
As Parcel 1 has no plan to mitigate the floodplain risk and Parcel 2 has no plan aside from extensive structure density, a well-informed thought risk-based decision that is in the best interest of the residents, the city, and the county simply cannot be made. Current infrastructure combined with the minimal expansion opportunities will not support this rapid overpopulation growth in this proposed location as we learned just yesterday that the underdeveloped or undeveloped quarter section to the east, um, immediately adjacent, has also applied for multi-family uh, 18 and TF3 rezoning. Traffic in this area will be impeded for years to come, especially for this plat, as it has only entry exit points on the two-lane portion of the 4th Street where a single underdeveloped four-way stop intersection supports all traffic today. According to WPD West Patrol, with the current crime experience at other local development sites, an immediate and long-term increase in crime will ensue. Unfortunately, the WPD has only two officers that typically work west of I-235 and Central during the overnight hours, which will lead to increased response times and reduced safety to localized residents. Additionally, there has been a plethora of opposition to this proposal from residents throughout the impacted neighborhoods with zero known support and according to uh, number eight of the nine golden rules established by the MAPC, this fact should be given consideration, whereas yet we have yet to see any, unfortunately. Um, to the extent that we are informed that our concerns in relation to our property devaluation and negative impact to the area, um, and I quote, don't carry any water. Uh, we respectfully disagree with that statement. Uh, with perspective as current homeowners shouldn't carry the undue burdens that will be placed upon us uh, by this development proposal. Collectively, these concerns are highly relevant and should be given consideration when making a recommendation decision. There are too many unknowns and the risk is too high to proceed hastily given all proposed projects in this immediate area. So thank you for your time and we look forward to working with you all through this. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? Okay, next speaker, please. Your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes. My name is Wes Gallion. I'm president of the Builders Association, and I'm here today to speak in favor of the proposal that has been presented by Mr. Gish. But I want to, I want to cover several things that I think are important here. Developers in this area pride themselves on having a good and productive working relationship with staff in various departments of cities and counties that are involved in critiquing development proposals from start to finish. Key for developers and their engineers is gaining access to all information and must be adhered to at each step of the development process in order to assure that certain levels of compliance are achieved. Going through this process, which has many and varied steps that must be taken, is when the developer and his consultant agent interact a great deal with local city and county staff at all levels to find out what must be done to achieve compliance. We believe it's of critical importance that developers and key others involved be able to rely on professionals on what professional staff advises must be done specifically in varied instances to obtain compliance approvals so as not to have to deal with surprises that come up that are beyond what developers were advised had to be done and was done to assure compliance. If there are such issues, we believe those issues need to be made known to the affected parties early in the process so that developers and their consulting engineers can deal with them before we get to the commission level for the benefit of all concerned as much as possible. Some time ago, we were able to secure an informal understanding with elected officials at the city and the county and non-elected management and staff of cities and counties as well that, pro that processes, requirements, policies, and et cetera imposed on them would not be changed unless the stakeholders impacted by any such changes were met with to determine what impact would be, what impact that would likely be, discuss concerns that were raised, and work together to develop solutions to concerns to further refine and make more predictable the review and approval processes for development. We, we try to stay mindful of that all the time. We call people in the city and county, state level, and others to discuss concerns and raise concerns we have. We get that courtesy in return from, from most people, not everyone. Depends on the circumstances. So it, it appears that though over the last several years, last about year, year and a half in particular, there's beginning to be a breakdown in some instances that will lead to more problems developing as we go forward together, if not 
dealt with. And that's our biggest concern. We have got to be able to work together. We have got to be able to rely on codes, standards, policies, procedures, and what have you that are not that judgments to avoid judgments being made in a subjective way. For the last 14, 15 months, we have been working with fire and others and have had a and come to a good understanding of what needs to be done, and we have to be able to rely on that. If not, it throws a wrench in what's going on. It implies the projects aren't as safe and as, as, as desirable as they should be, and that's blatantly unfair to allow that occur. What we're asking you today, in consideration of what Troy talked to you about this morning, about getting together and looking at issues and talking about concerns and coming up with recommendations that we can all embrace and have had input into is to approve this project that has been proposed and it won't be long till maybe we'll have those recommendations brought forward so we can all deal with them. I think in this particular case, Epcon Communities has shown they build a first class community. The issue of whether or not people feel safe in them is answered by the number of people who quickly buy in them, live in them, and enjoy living in them. So that's an opinion, it's not a fact, but the fact is they are desirable, they are people buy them, they move in them, they love the lifestyle. And you got to consider at 55 and over, people don't get out as much as they used to. And when they do, they don't go as fast. And, and so <laughs> they stay home more than others. You don't follow me to work, do you? Um, well, I no. can't follow you anywhere because uh, I can't keep up. That, that brought us, <laughs> your time is concluded. I let you go over because I recognize you as an expert representing an organization as was the Homeowner Association representative. So, Any additional information you feel critical for the commissioners to hear from well, your perspective? I think I've made my, my point okay. and I hope you consider Any, that. And the other thing we will make sure we do, we, we pledge our support to work with the city and the county as we've always tried to do and and Troy and the staff that he'll be putting together come up with the best of the best practices and whatever else we can all embrace as we go forward to eliminate this conflict. So what I understand is that the group that's being formed is really what the builders community appreciates having that opportunity to work out some details and look at going forward. Yes. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, Mr. Gallion, Commissioner Green? I have, I have one in, that's kind of in general, and I think maybe... Uh, uh, staff might be able to answer this uh, better than than uh, than Mr. Gallion. Um, the subdivision committee and the planning commission are we uh, is our task uh, and are we assigned to uh, approve uh, cases that come before us, uh, whether we see issues with them or not. Kind of a longer answer than probably we want to do. Um, the actions, this is a one-step final plat. So you look at it as it is uh, similar with the filing of preliminary and a final at the same time. The um, subdivision, uh, the action by the subdivision committee, and then ultimately approved or disapproved by this board as a, as a whole, it basically says, um, the subdivision committee shall approve a final plat or a one-step final plat in this case if the if it substantially is uh, the same as an approved preliminary plat which we're looking at a little bit different and mm -hmm. there has been compliance with all the conditions restrictions and requirements of these regulations and of the other applicable laws and regulations and there has been compliance with any condition that may have been required at the time of the preliminary plat or approval so it's not a final step. Now, when I talked about this before, I said you should be given deference to the opinion of the experts that we have on the subdivision committee. We're very fortunate because some communities don't have that level of experts we have. So, you know, deference should be given to those positions stated. However, if you think that the condition, which I talked about as a safety issue or something, you can state that and articulate the reason why you think safety for example may be a condition that has not been met as a basis for your opinion okay any other questions and then i i guess then then we're not just supposed to since this is a one-step final plat it is different in the sense that we didn't really have an opportunity to look at this as a, at the preliminary stage and now at the final stage it's all it's all a one-step thing that's yeah. correct so um uh i guess we we do have the uh, ability to uh, make changes. We're not just supposed to rubber stamp everything that, that comes before us. 
not necessarily rubber stamp in a sense because you, now you, what you've got in this particular case is a fire marshal that says he agrees with the plat. So you need to articulate reasons why you think the safety factors override his decision. Okay. Well, I, know that this has, I know that this has been an ongoing conversation for, for several years, um, and so it's nothing new uh, when talking about the safety aspects uh, of subdivisions that have uh, a single uh, point of uh, access. Since we know that a, a commission is talking about it, I would like to proceed to the next speaker. So would you state your name and address for the record, please? And you have name is minutes. Jay Russell, 2738 North Curtis. When this controversy first started in September of 21 on the Brookfield South Platte, it was a conversation about eliminating fire access roads. We call them emergency access locations, but they've changed the wording. After we found out what the problem was, and it was basically directed at maintenance, we had a conversation with the chief uh, fire marshal, Chris Dugan, and we came up with six solutions to their problems, all of the things that they identified. And uh, the fire marshal Dugan would, if he, if I need to verify it, he's here. But we came up with, we need to put curb cuts on every one of these fire ac access locations. We need to put two signs at the front next to the curb, two signs back where it may go through a fence, two on the other side and two at the curb on the other side of that. We also said that it needs to be put on GIS so that EMS and fire and PD know where it's at. Uh, we also said that they need to be inspected once a year. Every year when the fire department goes out to drain the fire hydrants, they should be in, looked at by the firefighters. And if there's maintenance that needs to be done, a note needs to be sent to the HOA and all of the HOAs of the subdivisions that I do are required to maintain those. But the key thing that we came up with is the issue of EMS and fire, or EMS and PD not being able to get through these gates. The fire department has bolt cutters. They don't really care what's up there as long as it's chain, they're gonna cut it. Now, what we came up with as a solution is a padlock with the combination 0911 on it. So any emergency services, they know what that is. And ever since September, October of last year, those recommendations have been on the table. And I'd like for you to verify that you sent that out to, to dispatch and to all the departments that they've known about that for 15 months now. Last night was the first time that in a meeting with the chief that the issue was more of access of letting the people out. So I said, hey, that's an easy solution. I had a subdivision called Pier 37 at 37th and Ridge Road that had an electric gate on it. That gate broke on occasion. So we had two padlocks on the emergency access. One was the 091, one for the emergency services, and the other one was a combination that every person who lived in that neighborhood had the combination to. So, Last night, we believe we come up with a solution to that problem. However, this particular project is not going to be up and running for six to seven more months before they ever get asphalt. And I'm pretty hopeful that in these meetings that we have with city staff, we can come up with some more solutions and maybe some better ideas. But here's the number one problem we've dealt with for the last 15 months. Ever since the Brookfield project came up, We've been told every month we will sit down with the stakeholders. We'll talk to the development community after we figure out what we're going to do. Well, we have just sat back and sat back for 15 months. And now we've gotten to the point where we're denying plats because we haven't, city staff hasn't gotten to us to where we can sit down and come up with some solutions on our own. Okay. So I hope that you can understand that perfection and these, these guys are being punished because of the tardiness of the city and getting back to us to come up with some other solutions. Thank you for your testimony, Jay. Question, Commissioner Green? Um, 
are, are you inferring that this plat was denied? Because I believe it was approved 6-1. They are opposed to uh, a full access right away. So in my opinion, yes, it was. It's a change of what the standard policy has been. Okay, because that, that, it's kind of misleading because we're talking about this, this specific uh, plat and to infer that it was denied is is misrepresenting what actually happened by the subdivision committee. But, but thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Russell, Commissioner Blick? I just have a quick question. So how, do you guys put in the gates as a developer? Are you guys required to put these gates in if they are re actually required? And how much do those gates usually cost you guys? There's a couple different styles of gates. There are some that we have used bollards, which is about three steel posts that have three locks on them that was put in by the city as part of the infrastructure project. They're not my favorite because you got to unlock three locks. There are also some that are put in by us that are wrought iron gates, we, and we typically leave a four-foot section open on the side of it so that pedestrian and bicycles can go through there. I'm a real good connectivity guy. I think that people should be able to walk through those. And yes, it's been brought to our attention that maybe those aren't wide enough at a 16-foot wide opening, and they're supposed to be 20. Nobody's been inspecting these for years. So bring us the problems and let us come up with a solution. So why, why do they even gate them? Is it just because they're afraid people in those residents will use that as an entrance and an exit? Let me go back to the example of Pier 37 at 37th and Ridge Road. The problem that we had there was that people would try and beat the light that's at 37th and Ridge Road and they would cut through there and cut through this neighborhood. It was only 28 houses. So you need to keep that locked so that you don't have that kind of traffic. But I also wanted to address something that Ms. Foster said about the security. Uh, is everybody familiar with what these flock license plate reading cameras are? In my subdivisions, we put those right there in the entryway. And the subdivisions that have one way in and one way out and an emergency access, we control everybody that goes in there with this camera. And PD is very supportive of it. They know every person that's gone through there and a copy of their license plate. So I hope, Ms. Foster, that that may have addressed some of your security concerns. I think you could probably put two cameras in as easily as one for not very much. They're $2,500 a piece per year. I have one question, Jay, and this is a totally different tact, but I've heard neighbors concerns that the houses in this development are going to be smaller. And you're a third party to this development, I believe. Yes. Um, but you've built a lot of homes. So can you tell me why a 1,000 square foot slab on grade would cost more than a 3,000 square foot two-story across the road? What are some of the factors that come into the costs of homes um, from your perspective? How do we get to 500,000 on that little puppy? I am a has-been builder. I don't build houses anymore. <laughs> okay. So I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. All right. All right. We'll ask. Yeah. I'll ask Mr. Gish when he comes back. Thank you. Uh, next speaker on this topic. Is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this topic? Then I would call Mr. Gish back, uh, please, for two minutes of rebuttal. Okay, thank you. I'll try to address the gentleman here, his questions first. Um, uh, I think um, just in general, these homes, uh, I would hope you will find them. Uh, if you, I know you visited them, you've said, but they truly are um, good neighbors, I believe, to traditional single family residential. I mean, they're, they're the same thing, but yes, they're denser and they're denser that way because it allows those people to afford the maintenance because the maintenance is reduced. Um, they have a much smaller yard and that. And I would also just uh, let you know that we have already uh, been in preliminary design 
with our client to uh, for the beautification that will be along uh, Central. And uh, we anticipate in that reserve that's located on the plat, I think it's reserve C unless it's changed, um, that there will be a, a berm in there. So uh, very similar to what you've maybe seen at Auburn Lakes, um, there will be a nice screening. And, of course, uh, the city has plans long term, and this developer would – would do probably something not quite to the scale of the city, but they'll have a pedestrian way that runs along this floodplain. It'll be a huge amenity. People will be able to walk in circles and do their, their passive uh, activities that way. But uh, because it's public, your community will have access to a great uh, resource, I would say. Um, so I think I, think, uh, I would hope um, there'll be a lot of good things in that regard that would benefit your neighborhood. I'm going to attempt to answer the value of the home. So, um, and, and uh, perfection is actually present if, if we really get into the nitty gritty, but, but these homes generally, uh, I think the smallest one is like 1,200 feet. There's not very many of those. They're way up above that. They're generally like 1,500, 1,700, and if they have multiple floors like they have uh, upstairs, I mean, I think they can get up to 2,000 to 3,000 square feet. That's why they cost the same, if not more, than other houses. Gotcha. So, thank you. That that answers my question. All right. Any other questions for the applicant at this point? Uh, yes, Commissioner Blake. I just have a quick question, Jason, and I'm not meaning this as a loaded question because I know you can't control Mother Nature, but as as an engineer and and your opinion. Do you see with this development that it could um, increase any additional flooding to the subdevelopment to the south, or do you not see that for your professional opinion? So um, that actually can be answered by um, Mr. Hickel, who's in stormwater management. Uh, we have submitted a drainage plan, and it uh, has received uh, his review and approval. Great. Thank you. Appreciate you. Certainly. Commissioner Hartman. Okay, so at subdivision, this was approved, but it wasn't approved uh, the way you wanted it? Yes, sir, that's correct. We, we were um, in disagreement. Uh, we, we'd like it to be approved as we presented it. And when we showed up, we thought it was good with staff, and that typically works. Um, so we were opposed to not receiving an emergency or a fire apparatus access road with a gate. Um, that's what we'd like to have at the far west end of Barn Owl Circle. And uh, we would like to not have uh, a street right-of-way dedication to the three acres that's available to develop to the west. Okay. Commissioner Foster, question or comment? Comment, I guess, to respond to what we talked about in the subdivision the the issues that came up was the access on the west end and then also having driveways too close to each other or road access too close to each other on fourth if that stub street eventually became a street that went down to fourth and also at the time i believe we were told that the fire department had not approved the emergency access because the decision about the gate had not made been made yet. Bear in mind that this is one of the potential problems with a one-step final plat is we never saw a preliminary. We, we could have discussed some of these issues at a preliminary stage had we had the opportunity, but we didn't because it's a one-step final plat. So the security, safety, to me, falls under the whole requirement of this board in general to sustain the public health, safety, and welfare. And welfare is a pretty darn broad topic. But that was what we were looking at. Those were the issues that were under discussion um, at the subdivision committee. OK, thank you. Any other? Commissioner Green, and then Jason has a comment. I, I think I could try to respond to Ms. Foster's okay. comment. So um, related to the access on the central, the typical, I'm not the traffic engineer, but the typical access management policy would recommend full movement turns no closer than 400 feet. Um, 
because there isn't any to the south currently, uh, the existing driveway that's on that three acre parcel of the little exhibit I handed out and the center line of our barn house circle meets or exceed that distance of 400 feet. So I think in general, like I said, I think in general it meets the access policy on our on an arterial street. If that helps answer that. That answer your question or your? I actually only wanted one access okay. over in the West End, the, the Stub Street for a s potential secondary access to the three acres was not something that I thought was necessary, but okay. I think we're well past that detail at this point. All right. Thank you. And did you still have a question? Yeah. On the, uh, I know that, that in the uh, initial uh, staff report, <clears throat> I've already addressed what, you know, with the fire, but I, I, and I did touch on the county public works requirement, uh, a request for the uh, access controls where they would uh, grant access control for a full uh, access uh, entrance uh, on the west end, but would not approve a fire apparatus access control. So thinking that, that all the I's were dotted and the T's were crossed, well, maybe, maybe they, they weren't quite all crossed. Uh, by uh, with what the uh, county uh, engineer had said in, in his comments in the staff report. So, um, okay. I don't know if you have anything. Was there a question in there? Or? I don't know if that's okay. something you want to address, uh, but th that was what we received uh, for staff comments. Okay. Um, we have had our rebuttal, and so I will. Bring this back to the board. Commissioner Warren. I'm going to make an attempt to address some of the issues coming up. Number one, this is a market driven project. This is the, the need for smaller properties that easier maintenance. Uh, this, is, this is where the market is going. Uh, I think that this property actually offers a buffer to some of the larger homes to the south by virtue of the road that is there. Uh, it, that actually is a, a built-in buffer that, that separates this neighborhood from other neighborhoods. So I don't believe that that's a huge factor in terms of this project affecting the value of the homes that, to, to the south of the, of the area. The, uh, the aspect of the, of the road, whether we have uh, two accesses or not, is actually two sides of the safety coin. One side says, I don't want more people driving through my neighborhood than it actually has to, and I want to control that to the best way I can, versus the safety aspect of having two accesses that allow emergency uh, vehicles into the area. I think we've set a precedent for the last several years that may change here pretty soon if the, as the, the city and the county and the, and the uh, placeholders come into play as to what, what is the, the right project in terms of access. Um, that the president that we've said is we've done this a number of times, a number of times where we've done one access uh, on a daily basis for, for the public to get in and out and then one emergency aspect. So to change the rules now at this stage of the game to me I think would be would be an unfair uh, disadvantage to the applicant. Therefore I would be in favor of approving the, the applicant's request for one main entrance entrance and a secondary emergency aspect a property entrance into the into the area. Um, it's, it's frustrating to, to think you know you know what the rules are and then have them have them change on you. We've had opportunities to to require a double access and we've and we've uh, gone with what the neighbors have wanted. Uh, we've even gone to the areas where we've had access that opens up to new subdivisions and then had all of the neighbors in those old subdivisions, please don't open this up. Even though it was planned to open up, they, they come down in, in huge numbers and say, don't do it. Don't open up our streets because we don't want the traffic. So I think that's going to be one of the questions that comes up when, the, when we look at what is the long-term policy on how we deal with this. We're going to have to deal with that issue what, of high, higher traffic by more connectivity versus the safety issues of more connectivity. And that's two sides of the, of the same coin. Therefore, I'm going to be uh, in favor of uh, granting the applicant's request. Commissioner Johnson, Bill Johnson. Mr. Warren, is that a motion? That is it. 
Would you also add this? There's a motion to approve the applicant's uh, request, request for one main one main entrance. Okay. I have a would, motion from would, Commissioner would, Mo Warren. Would you add the uh, uh, padlock with the combination on I would add anything that we needed to, to clarify that, that, that aspect of the request. Yeah, what we have padlock or a, a electric system um, that it will be controlled uh, by uh, to allow all emergency vehicles into the end of this area. All of our construction sites we use that combination deals work very, very, very well. And so I will second your motion. Does that include a street stub to the west? Does that include a street sub no, that was, stub that to that the west? No, that includes the access to the to central. Okay. No street stub? Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this map, and I don't see that stub ever coming to fruition. I, I, don't, I don't see why we would add that. I'd like to Johnson? make a substitute uh, motion. Basically, when at subdivision, I tried to do that thinking that if we did have that, then that would be access into that three acres. By not doing that, there's a possibility we'd have another entrance off for the three acres. So I'm fine with your motion, and we'll just have another access to the three acres when it's developed. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And I have a point of clarification on, okay. on his motion on Chuck's warrant. Um, that coded padlock is for uh, emergency, not not only emergency, but also for the residents in to get in the neighborhood. I'm open to any of the any of the options that, that we can get agreement to. I, it's yeah. Whether it's open to, to all, I mean, I'm I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of it being just police. I, the the main the ones that I want to have access to are, are the emergency uh, responders. Uh, if the neighbors want it. Then, then I would say give it to them. Well, I just see that, you know, that that, that would help uh, solve some of the safety concerns that, that have been expressed uh, with them being landlocked. If the main entrance in and out is blocked for some reason, they would at least have a, an avenue to get out. Of if that would the garner separation. your support, I would add that to my motion. Well, it would certainly go a long way to garnering my support if we had that, where the, neighbor, where the, where the residents had access. I have my motion to allow the residents that access to that code okay i have a question from mike mike are we getting concerns from neighbors that they can't get out or we had problems with that i've been i've never heard of that no but but it doesn't take much to to uh thought to when when you've got one point of access going in and if somehow that access is blocked people aren't going to be able to get out and they wouldn't come with their concerns to this board because by that time it's well past any input from us anyway. I don't know. I've been dealing in this with this business for 50 years, and I've never heard anybody have any problems with it. And I, we've this entrance deal has gone back 20, 30 years ago. I mean, John knows all about it. We've, we've gone through this thing years and years. And, and why we're all of a sudden deciding on this particular plant that we have to change it, I don't, I don't get with that. But I, I agree with Chuck's uh, proposal. <laughs> We had in there someone who wants to make a, a well, substitute I'm, motion. I'm still Do you still want to? to? Okay. Clarifying the first John, motion. Commissioner McKay. Well, we, we we talk about the safety of people being able to get get in and get out. If there's an emergency situation, how many people in this subdivision or any subdivision is going to jump in a car and want to get out? You know, they, they they got but they still got legs and they can access in and out of the thing themselves without jumping into their vehicle. In fact, the majority of the time, people won't even touch their vehicle. They want to get away, so they'll do the emergency by walking away from the from the project rather than jumping in my car and, and going doing something. Second thing is, I've been sitting there being quiet because I live in one of these subdivisions. It's in Bel Air, but I live in one of them. It's called Elk Creek. Uh, I know I haven't built a house in 30 years, but I did it for a couple of years before that. And what has been mentioned the reason why these projects are successful is because of exactly what they're saying. There's a group of people out there, which is the largest contingency of people in the United States today, that are like me. They're old people. And they want some place to okay, be with though. old people. Let's put it that way. So these people are doing a service. In the subdivision that I live in at Elk Creek, the only thing, with the exception of two houses that they're finishing up, these type of houses, courtyards, everything else that's going on is single family, Large houses in the same subdivision, 
intermingled with this. So uh, I, I haven't said anything sitting here. And I think this danger situation we're talking about, being able to not be able to get out and get, and get in and get out. I don't know how many people are going to jump in their car when something comes up to get out of that house, get out of that area. They're going to get out of there with their feet, crawl, run, whatever they can do to get out of, this, out of the way. This is Joe coming to comment. Go Madam ahead, Chair. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Joe Johnson, go ahead. I see nothing wrong with requesting the emergency exit. I mean, if there's an accident at the main entry and, and these old people that live in this community have somebody has a heart attack and has to get out or, or just has some kind of a physical problem, they need to get out of there. And, and why not have that provision, whether it's used or not, in the next five years? Uh, yes. I the motion, a we did um, uh, add to the original motion that the ability for residents to exit would also be included in that coding mechanism. As a, is that accurate reflection, Commissioner Warren? The residents could get out through a similar code through the second access. Absolutely. Okay. I thought John was speaking against it. John, were you speaking against the... No, I'm not speaking against it. I just made a comment where I live. <laughs> and that you would get out on foot, you wouldn't drive. Is that right? And then, I, and then okay. I'm old. But okay. I'm also saying that okay. the, the subdivision that we live in, they're building, right now, they're building big houses, intermingling with what we've got and where we're living. And I don't know of any of in our area that's 1,200 square feet. Most of them are like 1,700 to 2,200 yeah. square feet, so... That's where you kind of get your cost, okay. I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I make a... Commissioner Cunningham, go ahead. Um, being relatively new to this board, but not new to real estate, um, I think one of the catching points is that the ordinance says 30, anything, any o over 30 units has to have two openings. And as we go forward, these subdevelop these subdivisions are going to become more and more dense. And so comparing <clears throat> comparing them to a third and a half acre lots with with a single family home on them, it, it isn't uh, isn't the right thing to do. But I think also in this in this instance, I think if if the fire Fire code, I mean, if the, the fire marshal says it's okay, which he didn't say in the beginning, which caused a lot of confusion, um, I think I'm okay with passing it. But when they put that board together of stakeholders, I hope it includes uh, members of the buying public, uh, the public at, at large, so we have a balance of what's expected in these, in these uh, new age subdivisions. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Nix. Uh, so I think we've just about worn this thing out. I mean, I'm tired of sitting here and listening to it. Uh, I also happen to serve on the subdivision committee. So, you know, those of us who show up every other week and are presented with these plats have quite a little bit of responsibility. If, if, We've been misled in some fashion, which it feels like we have a little bit to me. I mean, or once we're maybe maybe this is good that, that things are coming to a head and that we're going to get a group of people together and we're going to tighten this thing up so that when we sit here, we're not going to have to have this conversation. And you know, again, it's just uh, it it, it kind of upsets me a little bit. I mean, I'll go along with with the uh, with this plat, but I just want to say that in defense of the people that serve on that subdivision committee, I think we do the best job that we can. We're all honest, decent people. Uh, we do the best job that we can. Uh, and so I, I take a little offense to some of the comments, uh, only because we try, try, I think, to follow the direction of the staff. And we believe, well, we have a professional staff. We've got all that input and that we should be capable of making the right decisions. Well, then it comes along and we say, well, you guys, maybe you screwed it up. You didn't, you know, you didn't uh, consider everything. It's it's a little upsetting to me when I hear that. But nonetheless, I'll go ahead with uh, with this, and hopefully, we can get a group of people and tighten this up so we get a little better direction when we have our meetings. 
right? I okay. Yes, Commissioner Foster. All right. I would like to make a substitute motion to approve as originally proposed by, well, no, not as originally proposed because we're leaving off the sub street, to approve the plat with the condition of a full access public access to fourth on the west end of the of the plat as we have discussed before i would just say that i i understand the importance of having data and having criteria that you're designing to and having precedent be upheld but that doesn't necessarily mean you're locked into every precedent that's every set because some of them shouldn't have been set. The fact that uh, a given subdivision only has one access doesn't necessarily make that good planning. Um, you know, they build giant condominiums on barrier islands in Florida because the market likes them and the developers make money off of them, but it's still a really stupid thing to do. I don't think in this case we're that drastic. It's a, it's it wasn't an arbitrary or capricious decision on the part of the subdivision committee. It was one additional condition to extend a proposed cul-de-sac a few extra feet and make it a full access on the road. That's it, and that is my explanation for my proposed sub substitute motion. So, substitute motion for a full entrance, full access entrance on the west and the east. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second it for, for discussion purposes. All right, then. So, we have a substitute motion. I'm going to call for a vote second. on the substitute motion. Yes, okay. On the original motion, how will the access controls on Central be addressed uh, by the county engineer if we are to uh, approve the fire apparatus access road. I would like to... S uh, I would yes? say that, that, would be, that would be staff's Response. res responsibility to come up with a plan. I don't know that we have that, if that's a detail that we have to be able to answer at this point. We've, we've given the intention of what we want. I, and I, I just I know that that during uh, discussions at uh, subdivision, uh, th those were uh, s concerns and uh, one of the basis for the decision to uh, have that be a full access was so that there could be access you know, uh, uh, access agreement on on central uh, but, as opposed to or being in lieu of the uh, fire apparatus access road. And, and also, when this, and I, I was, I'm on the subdivision committee too. When this first was presented by the agent, he pointed to that cul de sac and said, if we have to, we can. There's plenty of room there. We can make a full access there. I'm pretty sure that's what started some of this discussion. And then another commissioner asked, What's the likelihood of you opening that up uh, at a later date? And that's when he said, we're not going to, we don't want to do that. Okay. So we confusing have, from the beginning. We have a substitute motion on the table and we have a second. We've had considerable discussion. So I would like to uh, call for a roll call vote, please, on the substitute motion. And a roll call vote, a vote of yes, yes. I'd like to have the applicant's re reaction to Oh, okay. The Jason, it, is it, what are we understanding that, what's your, yeah. Will you react to these two motions? Are you able to turn that second one into a full access entrance? And would you accept that? We, we would desire the first original motion made. Uh, we would, the developer would prefer no public street access at the west end but would like to retain what's been agreed to with fire for a uh, fire apparatus access connection with a gate and your understanding is that's what complies with the minimum code standards that are on the books at this moment that's our understanding correct okay did that answer your question 
Okay. All righty. Roll call vote on the substitute motion. Did you have a clarification, staff? Okay. The substitute motion. This is on the substitute motion. Fox? I have to think this through. Okay. I'm going to vote no, but I also, with deep respect to the sub to subdivision committee for really working hard to say what does safety call for and recognizing that there's a group looking at this going forward, I do believe it's unfair to ask them to comply with a rule that is being changed midway um, when we don't have any evidence of danger having happened. So I'm a no, but thank you, subdivision committee. I know you spent a lot of time on this. Dual. No, and I would add that I'm glad to hear that this thing is finally going to come to a resolution with the city. McKay? No. Green? Uh, yes. Bill Johnson? No. no. Blick? No. Nix? No. Foster? Yes. Warren? No. Joe Johnson? No. Miles? Yes. Hartman? No. Cunningham? Reluctantly, no. Williams Bay? No. I have the vote is 3 to 11. The motion fails. I'll now call for a roll call vote on the original motion. I, I clarif clarify the motion again, Chuck, would you? Approve the applicant's request uh, for one main entrance to the east and no access to the, to the west entrance other than emergency ac access and the ability for the homeowners uh, association, that should they desire to have access to on an outgoing method of and, their choice. And no stub to the west. No stub to the west. Thank you. Okay, any questions to clarify that motion or comments, uh, Commissioner Williams Bay? Could that outgoing be an opening as well as a gate? They desire. I think that I give the the applicant the the leeway to figure out how they want to do that. Okay. Uh, roll call vote, please. Yes, ma'am. Fox. Yes. Duel. Yes. K. Yes. Green. Yes. Bill Johnson. Yes. Blick. Yes. Nix. Yes. Foster. No. Warren. Yes. Joe Johnson. Yes. Miles. No. Hartman. Yes. Cunningham. Yes. Williams Bay. Yes. Motion passes 12 to 2. Next case, please. Thank you, everyone, for your Anne. energy. Yes, Cindy, yes. Commissioner Miles. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to drop off. So okay. I just wanted to let you know. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Miles is uh, leaving the meeting. Yes. Four o'clock, and it's three fourteen now. Okay. We're going to move on. Item 2.2, .2, Subdivision 2022. Neil, would you present this case, please? 2.3. I'm sorry, 2.3. Gateway Edition. <laughs> this is a plat located in the northeast corner of 37th North in Greenwich. This encompasses one lot. A zoning is PUD, Plan Unit Development. Uh, the plat is adjacent to Wichita's boundaries and will we'll need to be annexed. Uh, Public Works has required the applicant to extend water and sewer. Uh, the drainage plan has been approved. We can go to the next slide. Yes, it will. The event center, yes. Next slide, please. It'll be the next case. Next slide. 
Uh, access controls to plat denoted complete access controls along Greenwich and an, one emergency opening along 37th Street North. <coughs> Uh, there's also a new street dedicated with the Platt Brist Bristol Street, and the applicant is the subdivision committee approved the plat with the opportunity for the applicant to discuss the right of way of Bristol, which is being shown as 60 feet, and traffic engineering re requested that be 66 feet. So that will be uh, that was approved with applicant and engineer traffic engineering to discuss that. That concludes staff comments. Question for staff. Any questions for staff? Hearing none, uh, applicant or agent, please, for this case. Chris Rose with Boffin Company, agent for the applicant. The applicant agrees with staff comments, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for the applicant? Commissioner one. Gringo. Yeah, Gringo, that's it. There we go. We know. Gringo. <laughs> You've heard me on the radio <laughs> during, during festival. That's how I answer on the radio at festival. Um, one thing that wasn't discussed at the uh, subdivision meeting, and I it dawned on me uh, as I was driving home, um, the 66-foot right-of-way, which is, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, is there a cul-de-sac or a temporary cul-de-sac at the north end of that? I I didn't see it mentioned anywhere, and it just dawned on me that there wasn't. Um, is that going to be a, a deal breaker to have a, a temporary cul-de-sac until such time that it does connect with something else to the north? It, you know, if we'll talk with traffic engineering when we talk about the 66. Uh, I think the 66-foot right-of-way should not be required because we haven't done that for so long. 64 foot is our standard, but we will just con continue discussion with uh, traffic engineering and I will discuss that with them as well. Thanks, Chris. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I didn't think of that when we were <laughs> talking about it a week ago yeah. and other things going on. And I'm not, you know, Neil also might, it might be in the subdivision regulations that it is required. So I will discuss with Neil as well. Thanks, sir. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to make comment on this case? It's 37th Street North and Greenwich Road. Anyone participating virtually who would like to make a comment on this case? Gateway Edition, one step final plot. Hearing none, I bring it back to the Commission. Move we approve per staff comment. Motion approved. Second. Second from commission, motion from Commissioner Green, second from Commissioner Warren. Any discussion? All in favor by indic indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Motion passes 13-0. Our next case is item 4.1, conditional use 2022 at 8558 South Hydraulic. Could I have the staff report, please? Thank you, Aaron. Good afternoon, Erin Ewok friend with the planning department. Conditional use 2022 0045 is a request um, to permit a, an event center in the county on property zoned RR rural residential. The site is um, approximately um, just under five acres in size and is located in unincorporated Cedric County and the property is currently undeveloped. You can see on the map here that the subject site is located on the east side of South Hydraulic Avenue, just north of East 87th Street South. <laughs> Abutting the site to the north is property zoned SF20 single family residential, developed with single family homes. To the south of the site is property zoned SF20. Um, I'm sorry, um, RR Rural Residential developed with single family homes. And then properties um, to the east are, are zoned SF20 single family residential developed with single family homes. 
and properties to the west are zoned RR rural residential and developed with single family homes. The applicant intends to develop a 5,000 square foot assembly space on the property should the request be approved and will offer the site um, to rent for weddings and similar events. Events will generally occur indoors um, with the exception of some ceremonies that will be permitted to take out place outside in the area that the applicant has um, named the meadow area and when we get to the site plan I will show you where that is located. Should the request be approved, the surrounding residential properties may experience some noise and light pollution during events due to the proximity to the site. Um, in addition to the supplementary use regulations that um, apply to event centers um, approved by conditional use, the applicant has provided a list of self-imposed um, conditions to mitigate any potential negative impacts on the surrounding residential properties. Um, let's see. Paul, could we go to the site plan, please? So you can see one of the, um, the conditions that the applicant has proposed is maintaining the existing tree line um, where the property um, abuts the single family residential neighborhood to the north, um, and then filling in with additional trees where necessary to provide um, some visual screening between those residences and the proposed event center property. Um, additionally, there will be a screening fenced fence that's put set back in the tree line um, to provide additional separation and um, help with some of the noise that potentially um, could travel north from the site. The applicant has agreed to um, limit the hours of operation for the facility to Monday through Thursday from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Friday through Sunday 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. The use of the meadow area, which is um, this area down here, um, would be limited to outdoor ceremonies that would need to take place between noon and 7 p.m. There would be a requirement for paid security at all events. Amplified music would be restricted to the um, insulated facility, so amplified music would not be permitted outdoors um, for ceremonies or events of that nature that would be taking place in the meadow. You will also see on the site, so the applicant has um, outlined approximately um, 50 parking stalls. They intend to limit the occupancy of the space to around two, to 200 um, persons and the uh, zoning code requires one parking stall per every uh, four persons. So the parking that has been proposed by the applicant does meet the requirements of the zoning code. The property is not platted um, and so Issues of access to the site will be determined um, at the time of plotting. However, currently there is access to the site off of Hydraulic Avenue. Paul, could we please go to the um, future growth map? Thank you. Staff finds that the conditional use is in partial conformance with the community investments plan. The 2035 future growth concept map identifies the subject site as a rural growth area um, and these areas are suitable for agricultural uses, rural based businesses and larger lot, residential exurb and subdivisions. The requested conditional use is consistent with those identified for the rural area so um, the request is in conformance with that component of the plan. However, the proposed conditional use is not in conformance with um, the locational guidelines which um, suggest that higher density residential uses and neighborhoods ser serving commercial uses buffer lower density residential uses from higher density commercial uses. And so due to the, um, the sites directly abutting the suburban scale um, residential development, there is not um, adequate buffering to transition in scale and intensity of uses from the event center to those single family residences um, abutting the property. So with that, staff is recommending that the application 
um, be denied based on the information received prior to um, the public hearing and the staff report. The Should the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission determine that the application should be approved um, and adopt additional findings to support that, staff has identified um, conditions to help reduce the potential negative impacts to surrounding properties. Um, and largely those follow the um, self-imposed conditions that the applicant has um, provided, as well as, um, of course, the adherence to the supplementary use regulations for event centers um, approved by conditional use in the county. If we could go to the site photos, please. So you can see that this is the entrance to the subject site. There's currently a gate, um, and the the established trees kind of serve their intended purpose in this photo because you really can't see um, past the roadway into the site. So, um, but the site is, is there's more of that clearing kind of back behind the tree area. Next photo, please. Um, so this is property north of the subject site. So that single family residential subdivision. Next photo, please. Um, southwest of the subject site. Next photo, please. I'm sorry, previously northwest of the subject site. This is southwest of the subject site. And then next photo, please. With that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Questions for staff? Yes, Commissioner Hartman. Do you know of any other event centers that are located in uh, areas like this that are completely surrounded with single family homes? Um, I do not. Um, I know that there um, have been similar re requests that we've seen recently, but um, I don't know of any operational event centers um, that have that same kind of um, neighborhood makeup. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Hearing none, applicant, are you present? Is the applicant present? Um, sorry, I did want to quickly meet, oh, uh, mention okay. that this did go to um, the um, CAB 2 on um, Tuesday, and they voted to recommend denial of the request um, 7 to 2. Okay, thank you. Okay, now applicant, if you come forward, please state your name and address, and you have 10 minutes to tell us about your project. Hello, my name is Gift Uloho. Um, I reside at 7917 West Meadow Pass Circle, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, thank you for your time and your consideration as we address the plans we have for this conditional use change request. Uh, we are a small family-owned business and have been involved in the wedding market for nearly 30 years, uh, providing a unique venue which brings family and friends together uh, is very important to us. We believe that quality-owned local businesses are the backbone to any community and would appreciate the opportunity to invest in the betterment of this area. Our family has lived and have been a part of the Wichita area for the last 40 years and have witnessed the revitalization of downtown and the Delano districts. This has shown that forward thinking brings together a mixture of business and residents to form a unique experience. Business and residents working together can be a great asset to the community. We are aware of the proximity of our business to the surrounding homes. In fact, we have our own personal reputation and interest invested as we live, have lived in this community for the past 17 years. We enjoy nature and the tranquility that this uh, area provides. Uh, as you can see from our inspiration photos, uh, we plan on maintaining the atmosphere uh, of nature. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Um, as you can see here uh, in the blue, that's the area of the five acres. And then north, east, and south, that's the properties that we own. And my parents do live on that northeast uh, one and a half acre lot. Um, our family had the opportunity to purchase this property nearly 10 years ago. Uh, when we took ownership, the property was in desperate need of attention. Since we live adjacent, we wanted to, the property to be safe and maintained. There was still a standing home and other abandoned structures which were in the process of falling down. 
There was no activity on the property, leaving it open for people to dump their trash and to gather. Much time and investment has been spent in the cleanup and maintenance of this five acres. Um, even though we are vigilant of this property, the lack of activity and established structures invites unauthorized trespassers. We feel that with purpose of use, this land will keep trespassers at a minimum. Low impact to our area is what we're striving to accomplish. As we live, have built in requirements to implement the peace that this community affords. We believe that nature in this area should dictate the building design and not let the building be the main object of focus. Minimal trees will be uh, cut down in the center of the property with no tree loss on the perimeters. There will be no visible change to this land once the building is finished and the neighbors can enjoy the same views that they are accustomed to. In addition, wooden fences will be set back into the tree line to help buffer any minimal sound. No one appreciates a loud neighbor. Therefore, we will not allow outdoor entertainment at this venue. No concerts and the like will be allowed. Most activity will be on a Saturday with a venue viewing by appointment only. Our business model does not include operations every day of the week. We have been wedding photographers for the past 12 years. While doing engagement photo shoots, we have utilized the uh, natural setting of the five acre property. Couples enjoy the natural scenery and asked if they could also exchange vows in this area. For the last few years, we have photographed a few of these hour long vow exchange ceremonies, averaging four or five a year. Couples have enjoyed this and have asked if they can have their receptions there as well. But there is no possible way, possible way for this. Therefore, the next step would be to consider a building in which the ceremony and reception could be held. We wanted, wanted to be mindful of the continued peace of this area, so we have given much consideration as how to do this. Since noise is one of the most concerning areas, much thought has been placed on this area. To achieve minimal noise, we have added several ways to do this. An insulated building, wooden fences, additional cedar trees, and no allowed outdoor amplified music stated in our contract. To maintain an effective reduction of sound, a well-insulated building works well, with virtually no sound escaping. An insulated building is good at containing sound if it stays insulated. If doors and windows are left open, the sound will escape. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I just saw they put one here. I'm good. As you can see Sorry. on our contract, we are taking measures to reduce and confine the sound by requiring all doors and windows to remain closed during reception time. With the already established thick brush and tree line, added wooded fences, insulated building, and the enforcement of strong sound restricting rules, we can effectively reach the definition of minimal sound. During the hours of operation, we, we will be staffed and present. Additionally, during the reception time, paid professional staff will be required. This helps to ensure the guests adhere to the venue contractual rules. Professional security or county off-duty law enforcement will, will, will be outside to monitor arrivals, departures, parking lots, as well as general decorum of the guests. Having an authority figure on the premises is not only good for business, but also an asset to the community. With our hours of operation, we feel it gives uh, our hosts the ability to enjoy their event, but not interrupt the natural rhythm of the neighborhood's peace and quiet. Having an event center does bring additional activity to an area. However, the event center building is in the center of the five acre property, allowing for hundreds of feet of natural dense growth uh, as a buffer to the surrounding neighbor's property. Also, with the perimeter having this established tree line and heavy brush, and the addition of fencing, access to uh, the event center from neighboring yards is extremely difficult, if not impossible. The only way to access the event building is through the front street entrance. Again, there will be professional security and law enforcement present at, at this area. Any concerns that additional trash is addressed by activity being held inside. Also, there will be trash containers placed inside and outside of the building. Normal maintenance and cleanup after every uh, will be done by staff after every event. 
Hydraulic is a main street which is accustomed to traffic. Hydraulic runs north and south, the straight line, uh, with good visibility in both directions. We also will ensure any tree branches and pairing views will be trimmed back and maintained. Additionally, planned lighting for the entry area will be installed, plus temporary signage to help people easily identify the entrance. The lighting and signage will only be up during events as not to distract from the natural views. This venue's traffic flow will be much different than that of a concert hall, church, or even a school. When these types of events are done, you have a mass flow of people leaving all at once. Our venue is different because the 200 people max occupancy will taper off over a four hour time period, not leaving all at once. Some people will leave after pictures, some will leave after dinner, other after the toast, and yet more after the first dance. It will be a slow release of people over an extended period of time. The surrounding area should not notice a big difference in traffic flow. The 51 parking spots, which is in line with the four persons per parking space, has been laid out with most of the parking spots against hydraulic. This gives as much space for homes directly around the five acres. The parking lots have also been designed with awareness to the least amount of disturbance to the natural foliage of the property. The venue, supplied by its own water well and septic system, there will be no strain on the local utilities. Outdoor lighting will be at a minimum and be contained within the property only during event activities. In closing, we would like to restate our goals. Firstly, the building will be built to complement the surrounding five acres. There will be minimal disruption to what is currently naturally growing, no change in the look of the property seen by neighbors, structures put in place to protect the surrounding area from sound, this would be an insulated building, rules to enforce soundproofing, layered protection including wooden fencing and cedar trees. Our hours of operation would, would be Sunday through th uh, Thursday, ending by 7 p.m., Friday and Saturday ending by 11 p.m. No amplified sound allowed outdoors by contract, no outdoor entertainment, pay professional security, camera security systems, contracts with all clients and vendors who come onto our property, 200 guest maximum dictated by the 51 parking spots, and on property water, well, uh, and septic system. We are willing to fulfill recommendations that MAPC staff and board brings forward to help make this property a success. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll say, um, do we have any questions from the commission for the applicant? Commissioner Williams Bay. Have you talked to any, any of the neighbors about this? Uh, I have not gone to the doors and knocked. Um, we, that was something that we talked about, um, but we decided as a business it might be better going through this structured process. Um, my personal cell phone number was on the application. I have received um, a call and discussed and emailed over our site plan. So, um, Again, that's something that uh, uh, we chose to, to go through this process to have this have that discussion. The county advisory board met and discussed this. Were you present to give this presentation at that meeting? Yes, I was. You were okay. And we yeah, and we heard Did the vote. Co Commissioner, pardon me. Did they have a recommendation? Yeah, seven two to deny uh, from the uh, county advisory board. Commissioner Williams Bay, you had a question. Yes, now this site will be gated. The entrance to the site will be gated? Yes, it will be gated. So, so the uh, ability to come onto the property by the public will be by um, appointment only. So the gate will remain closed unless we have a, a time set up to be on property. So it will not be an open door policy or a retail store. Anyone can come in whenever they want to. Okay. And you said a few people got married out there just in the middle of nowhere with the trees watching. Yeah, this watching. is the meadow, and we're photographers, any, so we offered that. Any a, complaints from neighbors about those activities? We have, have you received not had any? any complaints. Uh, again, my parents live on property. You know, we have neighbors all around us, and I don't believe they have received any complaints. 
Okay. Commissioner Green, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your, your presentation. It was very clear and, and um, detailed. Thank appreciate, you. Appreciate all the detail that you gave us on that. Um, the outdoor activities that you may or may not have, mm -hmm. and you said that there would be no uh, uh, amplified sound? Correct. Um, and what I read in here would be just for, you know, like you've done already, pictures, maybe uh, maybe performing an outdoor wedding. Correct. Is is Have you ever used amplified sound for an outdoor wedding? Uh, what we've done right now, uh, since that property does not have electricity to it, uh, we've had like a small uh, battery-powered speaker uh, from what we've done in the past. Um, and again, as I said, when it comes to complaints, I've not personally received any. And again, we try to really watch that because in the past years, what we will do is go to the back deck of my parents' house and listen and by cell phones. Is, do you guys hear anything? And there, there's not been any sound uh, uh, going past those trees. So it, I guess it would be possible that you might have some outdoor sound for a wedding? So, uh, what, so what we're doing now is that if we're able to build the building, our business model might shift a little bit because that does give us the ability to give the choice to the brides if you want to have your ceremony outside for photos. But we have rules in place that we can't play music because of this. If you want to have it inside, though, you are more than welcome to do that with, with music. So the piano guys can't drop in with their grand piano and play and sing or acoustic band or, I mean. As, as far as what, what the rules state is amplified music. Okay. Um, so I would assume that means speakers. I would think if someone would want to sing to the bride walking down, you know, I don't see that being a problem. Um, but um, again, as set forth through the conditions, that's what we have to abide by. Okay. Abide by. Um, Commissioner Warren. Uh, I think I heard this in your presentation, but uh, staff gave us a number of recommendations that should we decide to approve your, your request, there were eight points that were part of that. Have you read that, and are you in agreement with those conditions? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If not, we'll move to public comments. So, again, if you'd line up at the front, if you'd like to speak on this case and give your name and address, please, uh, for the record and you'll each have three minutes. Go ahead. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Rick Thompson, and my wife and I live at 1729 East 84th Street South. It's one of the properties that is directly north of the proposal. Uh, we moved out there into the country to get peace and quiet, and it took us a long time to find a place. It's a wooded area, it was excellent. Little traffic, and we still had the same sense of a neighborhood because there's plenty of people there with the same, same buildings and one acre. I have concerns about the noise because several times during the summer on the weekends, well past midnight, we've heard festive music coming from that area. There was no one to complain to because we didn't know it was Sweet Tree, uh, uh, a place to get married. But it was well after midnight. I also have a problem with the potential building around that they're putting up. And uh, my property, the south part of my property doesn't drain like it should to the south because of that acreage. So we have a submersible and a pit on the east side that the rainwater goes to and we have to pump it to the north into the ditch on 84th Street. So we're opposed to the potential for noise, traffic, increase, trash, and we respectfully hope that you deny this proposal. Thank the you. applicant is indicating operating hours would end at 7 p.m. Um, if you knew that there was never going to be any Verbal noise outside after seven. Would that? With all due respect, ma'am, it ends at eleven. Oh, on the weekends. Weekends. Seven. Yes. Okay, but not after midnight. That would not be after midnight. 
but if you were to look at his building, it has barn doors on it, the ones he plans to build, okay. which means you can open okay. it completely up. So. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Next speaker, please. And as you come forward, um, we would ask that you not repeat any concern that's already been voiced, but add new concerns that you have from your perspective. Okay. And your name and address, please. Ronald Waltrip, 1821 East 84th Street. Uh, we, have, we live directly behind it to the east. We are concerned about several things, but the first is the property value. The studies that I have seen in uh, several articles say between 5 to 10% loss of value on our property. That is if it was in the city. Not, I have yet to find a report that says anything about rural and probably the reason is is because there's rezoning rules that say it has to be a 20 acre plot we are guessing we could probably lose up to 25 percent of our property value matter of fact we wouldn't have moved there if we knew this was coming um, the second and just to add on to what rick said about the noise is normally the normal decibel out there is 30 to 40 40 decibels DJs and bands at wedding events get up to 100 decibels. It's not always the noise that escapes. Sometimes it's the base of that. Like you're pulling up to an intersection, you have heavy bass. That is what we've been hearing out there for quite a long time. The other thing is, is there's no, excuse me, there's no noise ordinance out in the county. So we do not have any retribution or any way to uh, stop it if it goes over 11 o'clock if they leave the doors and windows open there's absolutely nothing that we can do to stop this um, if you hear a lot of passion in my voice it's because me and my wife work very hard to try to get this property and that's, that's all we've worked for, is to get out to the country so that we could have some peace and quiet, enjoy our grandkids and our kids, not have any of this extra noise from the city or venues till 7 or 11 o'clock. It doesn't matter. It's a very quiet community. And if you go to Zillow or Realtor.com, you will notice on both sides of Hydraulic in those housing additions, right now, currently, there are zero houses up for sale. That is because people enjoy being out there. They enjoy being away from the city and they enjoy the peace and quiet. Well, hopefully you guys will consider to deny this. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? Next speaker, please. My name is Tonya Ridpath. I live at 1500 East 86th Street South right there. This is in between 84th and 86th, right in that area. So I'm just, I can see this property from my back porch. Um, I want to, first of all, let you know that this does not comply with all the nine rules of zoning change. And I please ask you to deny this conditional use. I understand that a conditional use only goes with the person trying to do this, but it still opens up doors for commercial. We don't want commercial in this area. We enjoy the peace and quiet, but most gratefully is the traffic. Since the casino has been put in, we do have more traffic. Um, I was hit several years back at 79th and Hydraulic in a very bad accident by a drunk driver hitting the back end of me at the stop sign. Um, so as we all know, when people go to venues, people drink. We can't prevent that or anything else that does happen. So. I want you to understand that this is a blind turn. There is nothing there. It does not go into a residential area, which is before that. And I am the last turn in the residential on the other side of the street. So this can also slow down my traffic for me to get home. It will put cars into the dirt streets there of the other addition to get through. It's gonna put more wear and tear on those dirt roads that we already have issues with especially during rain time. Also, heavy vehicles. Just people wondering if they can't find the right turn. Think about it if you're following a GPS for a blind turn and you hit your brake. Where's that turn? Right there, we've got another rear end. 
So this is a very, very big concern for me. Um, I went out there to grow my grand, my children and have my grandchildren. It's going to bring a lot more traffic into our area. My kids like to play outside a lot. They go about three acres down, which is too hydraulic. Um, our neighbors allow that because we all enjoy the openness um, of our yards. And, um, you know, we're going to be bringing a lot of strangers into our area that we just don't need. So I just ask you guys to please understand that we're out there for reasons that are the fact that we don't have commercial. And this will impact our land. The stuff that he's going to have to do out there to make this legal as a venue and the concrete he's going to have to put in and the drainage that's going to happen. And that's what we're here for is the land use. We're residential. He will have to do some commercial stuff when it comes to the parking lots, the pavement, those ditches are not meant to drain. They're meant to hold. And we already deal with that extra water from rain seasons. And we're going to need a turning lane. That's just the way it's going to have to be. So we need traffic analysis. So I just ask you guys, understanding all these things, to please deny this request. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions for the speaker? OK, thank you. Next speaker, please. Again, new concerns or issues that haven't already been spoken, we'll uh, Correct. appreciate those. Thank you. Correct. Uh, first of all, I'm Charles Hacker, and I'm the trustee of Salem Township of Sedgwick County. And uh, I have to give you a disclaimer. I also live on 85th Street, close to this uh, venue and what they're talking about. But I'm here to primarily provide road information. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we need to advise you that throughout this plan, I just received it, and uh, we look at it, they refer to 87th Street frequently. It is a, a dirt road to the south of this. But the impact is, if you look at your traffic patterns, you have asphalt county roads, hydraulic is the primary one, and then you have 79th. 79th is a four-way stop sign up there for traffic. But 87th Street has a drainage issue to the east under Hillside due to the county's culverts being set in too high on Hillside. We have placed numerous loads of rock on 87th Street and trenched the adjoining ditches and worked with the county to improve it. But in spite of the improvements, the road is prone to flooding and extra traffic will be an issue after the heavy rains on that end. The locals use county roads, hillside, hydraulic, and 79th to navigate around this area. So during reading times, you should be aware that the traffic increase from the permit will affect those county roads. The second thing you need to be aware is currently, the property used as a wedding venue from Sweet Tree Ceremony Site, and the subsequent traffic is sustainable currently. And 87th Street can support the traffic adequately. And Salem Township has had no issues with the business or its customers. Do you have any questions? Yeah, questions for the, any questions for the speaker? Hillside, can you make the marker show which is Hillside on there? Or, okay, that's hydraulic is the main one through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the, you need to be aware that traffic is moderate to heavy and during Prone traffic times, what has been said about the traffic where they cut across and go over, it's, it's a problem. It's a four-way stop. It gets snarled up, and people do like to shuttle over to 87th to get around. Now, uh, that's all based upon business hours and traffic. Those are the primary ones, but it's constantly pretty heavy all of the time. And uh, a venue, this is the first time I've heard them explain about how they time it to go out. Uh, and I th we thought about, well, 200 cars is just way, way, if, if they don't do anything, it's terrible. If they do what they're saying and moderate it, it may be more acceptable. But I think they will be surprised how traffic on hydraulic really is a problem. Okay. Question for the speaker? Yeah, uh, so uh, uh, 79th Street is paved. Yes. And hydraulic is paved. Yes, and the hillside, too. And, That's on the other and side. And hillside on the other side, yeah. But Those are county roads, and because it's dirt, township is responsible only for 87. 
Okay. And 87th is the gravel dirt Correct. road? Correct. That you're talking and, about. And that's all I'm trying to address on 87th Street and its impact. Okay. okay. The, he did mention some concerns about drainage. Um, I don't believe this is going to need to be platted, but when they bring in the plan for the event center, what kinds of requirements would there be uh, related to drainage? Well, actually, because they are needing a building permit for the commercial use, it does need to be platted. And so a drainage plan will need to be reviewed and approved prior to the issuance of building permits. Okay, thank you. And, and he, that is correct that the, the ditches there are not drainage ditches. They're evaporative ditches, and they only hold water and it evaporates out. And I'll well, be glad to have them come it's, in. It's, and it's comforting to know that it, it since it is, uh, as uh, was stated, Philip stated, that uh, when they bring it in for platting, uh, drainage will be a component of that platting process. Right. Okay. So. Okay. Commissioner Blick, you had a question? Yeah, so on hydraulic, are you saying that there's just evaporated ditches, or are you talking about 87th Street? I'm talking about hydraulic. Hydraulic. And so, it is a major problem because it to us, because I live there, and those roads' entrances are 90 degrees uh, coming off of them, and they are deep ditches, and we have gotcha. seen vehicles down a pickup down in those ditches, and all you can see is whatever end didn't go in first. So a question I have is, is have you personally looked right in front of the applicant that's proposed in this property and see water that's sta standing there? Yes. Just in that one area, not the whole, all the way down the whole yes. street I, of hydraulic? I, he's, they're talking, I'm the next street down 85th going west. I pull out, I drive by this house, the, where they're at quite okay. frequently. We've been aware that they're doing the weddings. They never had any problem with them, but they're, they're, the increased traffic and the drainage is a problem. They, so, so it looks like it's a heavily wooded area and applicants talking about increasing by planting additional trees. Do you think that will be actually be beneficial and it'll suck up more of that water compared to some of the farmland that's around there now you got residential houses? I, as a, a general rule, uh, I'm not that expert on it, but what I have seen in tree lines do add more uh, absorption of the water, but you're talking about 20-year-old trees, not new trees. Okay. And and I think that's what he was talking about, is adding additional trees and stuff. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions for this speaker? The next speaker, please. I'll try not to disappear behind the podium. I apologize. <laughs> um, can I... Put it down. You can move it down, yes. Um, I'm Rhonda Lanier. I live at 8400 South Kansas Circle. Um, I'm actually um, also a local real estate agent, and I am the one person that did call you, Gift. Um, you were very generous with your time and your explanations, and I greatly appreciated that. Um, what I found a little disturbing is that after I spoke with you, um, it wasn't very clear to me that there was already um, activity happening on the site. So then I found out from, I don't live um, directly adjacent to the property. I live on one of the cul-de-sacs just north of the property, but close enough to um, have received the letter for this um, planning commission. And um, when I learned that they were already doing um, wedding sites, I then found their Facebook page. And um, they've been doing weddings there, according to their Facebook page, um, from before 2018. And they're advertising on their Facebook page. And um, I believe there was a live video at one of the bridal fairs that I came across to invite people to come down and talk to them about their full service wedding site. Um, so my concern is there's a lot of things that are being said and promised. But I now um, have a concern about how truthful they are being an upfront, they are being with their neighbors and with the public based on just this information. So um, that raises a lot of questions in my mind. And when you say events will end at 11, yet neighbors have already heard things going on till midnight. So who are we to call or they to call if they don't end at 11, right? 
Um, so you can understand that concern. From a real estate perspective, I do agree with some of the previous statements that the value of the houses, especially adjacent to the property, will be impacted. And um, these homes in the last couple of years have gone over market value. Um, I actually purchased two years ago and I paid over market value right before everything started going crazy. So, um, and I know a couple other neighbors did as well and they will have an impact to that after this happens. Any questions for the speaker? Thank you for your testimony, appreciate that. Uh, next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is James Swan. I live at 8426 South Kansas Circle, which is on the north side of this venue on the first street running north and south off of hydraulic. My concern is how are they going to address the drainage issues with them having adding parking, a building, that type of to their to their venue. <clears throat> I don't know how many people are here from the area that we that I live in. I'd, I'd like to okay. Right. How many of you you had water up almost to your house on several occasions? Most of us have because we do not have very good drainage in that area. And now, I think it has been reported already that when, oh, if this were passed and they platted the property, then a county surveying and full drainage plan with that, which they'd have to uh, comply would be enforced. Okay. And that generally helps the immediate neighbor. Well, I understand that they would have to get in, comply with, but the problem is we do not have adequate drainage as it is. That those ditches are not drainage dishes; they are evaporative dishes, like it's been messed, like it's been mentioned. So, without that even being addressed beforehand, I think that's that's a problem that all of us are facing, and that devalues our property as it is. Okay. Without a without a uh, commercial venue, which is not on twenty acres as per your uh, statutes. Okay, any additional questions beyond drainage at this point that haven't been mentioned? Did you have additional question, comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Again, we're just looking for the full range of issues that you're facing, so if there are additional uh, concerns that you want to express, please do come forward. Is there anyone, okay, we have one more speaker here. And then we'll be going to anyone who's participating virtually. So, Okay, my name is George Wetzler. I live at 8450 South Minnesota Court. Uh, my wife and I bought our house in 1998. Uh, October Halloween weekend, we moved in with an 11-inch rain that weekend. Uh, just for further clarification, there has been a county involvement in the drainage issue out there. There was a lawsuit settlement, and the issue still has not been resolved. Okay. Thank you. That's, thank you. Is there another speaker present? Come forward, please. Oh, have you already, you've already spoken, sir, so we only allow one time per person. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, uh, anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Hearing none. Um, applicant, you I would can, like to speak. Oh, okay, go ahead. Your name and address, I please. My name is Pam Hamilton, and I live at 8429 South Hydraulic, which is the street right before 84th. So this property is kind of catty corner from us. And I am concerned about traffic. Um, there's a lot of different turns uh when you're coming up i mean when you're going down hydraulic if people are coming off of 84th and turning off and on into that subdivision there's no uh it's not a no passing zone and i've experienced a lot of people coming and going and a lot of near mishaps um i'm concerned with all the traffic that's going to be there because it's so close to our driveway 
that if people forget where they're going or turning, then they're constantly pulling in your driveway and we don't have a turnaround in ours. So uh, we sit kind of way off the back of the road. I'm concerned about uh, all the extra traffic on the road. Even with the casino, it has picked up a lot versus beforehand that property already has a wooden fence on one side and we have heard music late at night and not not knowing where it was coming from so i believe that uh this party that wants to have this venue should be forewarned that the neighbors have heard it and we had no idea who you would contact to other than your local police department but of course, out here, it's just a sheriff that you call. And emergency uh, service out here is not quick and fast. Uh, you know, delay time is, is pretty lengthy if you have an emergency. So um, if, if, you know, you've read before, like I think this place in Hayesville at one time that had weddings, they had a shooting at one. What what would be the occurrence for something like that? People get drunk, they get to party in, and, you know, if something like that was to happen. What good is that for the neighborhood? I mean, everybody out here loves their quietness. Mm -hmm. And do you, the do neighbors you have that are across the street the other direction have a swimming pool in the summertime. I can hear them talking in their pool. I mean, noise travels out here so much more than people realize it's okay. it's uh i i can just imagine you know just the traffic and people conversing outside i'll be able to hear all of that okay. so you know i'm just concerned about about the noise i'm i've already experienced them late at night doing that ma'am i remember um when they excuse took over me that property excuse that property was never listed excuse for me sale. Somebody Hello, that works, ma'am. Your time is over. Do you have any other additional comment that someone has not already raised? Noise, traffic, um, drainage, um, uh, property values, anything else? Tell me the. I just have a question for you. What is the uh, speed limit on hydraulic in that location? Fifty-five. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any other speakers present? or virtual on this topic with new concerns. Okay, hearing none, uh, applicant, you can come back and you have two minutes to respond to the concerns that you've heard. All right, thank you, I'll try to get through these here. So um, first of all, I, I must push back with the, must have due respect, but when it comes to parties there past midnight, that has not been us. It just has not. We have no lights out there. I don't know how they would do that in the dark. So that's just, I apologize, but that's untrue. Now, I can say that my father called me, this is last year at some point in time, that there was a big party. It was not on our property. It's further south down on Hydraulic. They built a new home down there. I'm not sure if you know what I'm talking about. But they had a huge, must be a housewarming party. Because I actually went down, down there that next morning and they had loudspeakers outside and that, and that was that one time. I know people do play music on their back deck there. This area is hard to tell where, music, where sound's coming from. But as far as our end, we have had no activity out there past seven o'clock. You just can't see. So, uh, another point, uh, signage, I said, for them to see off hydraulic, we understand, but we will place signage and a light there that's there only during um, planned activities. Um, from 79th Street heading south into the event center, that's three quarters of a mile. In that three quarters of a mile, we have 17th Street and driveway access points. Coming from 90th Street heading north to the event center, you have 15 in, a, in that three quarters of, of a mile. In the mile and a half, which the event center sits in the middle of, you have 30 access points. These access points give visual cues to drivers of potential 
vehicles entering and exiting. So this 55 mile MPH, straight line of hydraulic, people are not setting their cruise control and cruising down the highway like they are um, on the highway. Okay. They're aware that, of people entering. Okay. That them. does conclude your time. Excuse me, excuse me, you've had your time for making comments and we ask you respectfully now to listen to the proceedings. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Any uh, additional questions from the commission? Okay, go ahead, John. Uh, staff, presently uh, no. the applicant, no, this is staff. Okay, I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Presently the applicants are having evidently weddings there presently anyhow. If we turn down the fact that this is just the building we're turning down or the use? JR, the question is about that they're having weddings on the site right now. And the question is whether we're turning down the use or just the building. The conditional use is for a land use. The building is already there, so I'm not sure how to answer that. It's, it's the use. It's the use as an event center. Well, no, the building yeah, is not I, there. Okay, my mistake. If if they're in violation, then the answer would be no. They, I mean, they there'd be enforcement action taken, or should be. My only question: What are they in violation of? It's their own property. They live there, and a friend wants to wants to get married there or you know, that's my only concern are we turning if we you know that it, it's been seven to two that it's been turned down by a couple of different groups what's to been turned down the fact that they still can use it the way they want to or that they want to put building on it i think it'd be the totality of evidence if i have a hundred friends and i have a hundred friends out over a two or three month period and i do that throughout the year probably a business and not just a private residence <clears throat> that's that so it'd be a totality of evidence and then we, of course, work with legal staff to help us make sure that that's correct. Excuse me. Uh, um, I did go to the website. It's a, it's a fully operational business that's advertised to the public and has been to the wedding expo and had a booth there. Um, they're in business. They're, they're selling their venue already, according, according to their own website. Sorry. Um, okay, back to the position now for our and, uh, commission, I bring this back to the table for commission discussion, please. Commissioner Warren. I'll tell a quick story because the day is long and everybody's getting tired. But in the early, early 80s, my dad built a, ca built a cabin on uh, a farm between Mulvane and Derby. And it became a place that was used quite often for a lot of activities. My son, when he graduated from high school, wanted to have his graduation party out there, and he went to my dad to ask for permission and was flatly turned down. He said, this is not something that I'm going to trust. You know, At which point my son pulled out about a 10-point action plan of what he was going to do to make sure that it was a safe activity with proper supervision and that it wasn't going to be something that he'd be concerned about. It's one of the few times I've seen my dad's mind get changed quickly. He looked at that and he said, okay. We're going to do it. I say that to give you that story because this is the best pl action plan for a, an event venue that I've ever seen. When I first saw the application and its proximity to the to the houses, I was I was going to say, well, there's just no way that we could do, we can do this. If you do it right, it, it, it can be done. I'm going to take a chance. I, I'm going to be in favor. I don't know if I sway anybody, but I will be in favor of approving your application. Um, Make a motion. And so I would make a motion to approve as presented with staff comments and conditions. Second. I have a motion from Commissioner Warren, a second from Commissioner Green. Uh, discussion. I'm dead. You'll need, we'll need appropriate findings for your motion in a, in a, because there, there aren't findings for approval in the staff report. Need some help from staff here for a while. 
if I can, uh, one what I think I've heard you say in your statement is that um, you've seen it as a good as a good plan, one of the best plans you've seen for an event center or type of this use. And so what I believe you're getting at is number three, which is the extent to which removal of restrictions will detrimentally affect nearby properties. And I think what I've heard you say is that the, the plan that they're presenting will help to mitigate uh, any any significant adverse impacts that would happen, that would be for adjacent property owners. Is, did I hear that correctly? Yes, you did. By having the activity indoors in a building that's insulated with all the doors and closed. Um, I, my understanding is that the photos we saw were ideas for the inspiration that it wouldn't necessarily have garage doors. And I did hear the applicant say that the doors would be closed at all times if any activity was going on. Um, Commissioner Foster. Can I ask what the enforcement mechanism for these, I mean, the self-imposed conditions that the applicant is proposing are, do seem to address most of the issues that I have with this land use, but how would they be enforced if, the, if, if they don't happen the way they are being told to us that they will happen? So based on a complaint, um, enforcement would investigate and then issue notices, and if that's not successful, if it continues in court actions, what would result from that? And then the conditional use would be? It, it, I think, actually can be. I don't know that they normally are, but it, I think that is an option where they just totally lose the right. Commissioner Blick. So uh, just, just some uh, discussion on this. Um, so I definitely appreciate everybody for coming out. I know it's taken time out of your day to come out here and speak and everything. So we definitely appreciate you guys giving us your input, your concerns. Um, I had some questions. I mean, I had some um, concerns also, and most of these concerns were addressed today. Um, flooding concerns with additional trees and with also they're going to have to provide a site plan. Um, reporting concerns, they can report it to the MAPCD, um, the Sheriff's Department, if there's an emergency that needs to be done. Um, property values, um, any development that has been increased over the farmland has it increased in property values. So in, uh, when you're looking at farmland, We've had this happen in the South Wichita before where, you know, we have people move out to the country and then they want peace and quiet and then here comes the business and here comes the more development and everything else. And that's just growth that happens. Um, and then also, um, we've also, we've also uh, approved the a wedding venue also probably about three years ago down on Hoover and 71st down in Hayesville. I haven't heard any complaints of it. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of complaints that happened from residents that came around the area, didn't want it, and they put restrictions, and the restrictions are being enforced by MAPCD. So, um, and then also the township. It sounds like there were some concerns a lot about flooding. Um, I think that a lot of that is to do with the, the township that needs to look at this, and, and there was somebody that spoke about it, um, and also the county. So I think there's some other concerns that some people uh, address, but I think that this is kind of out of the, the norm for this applicant. So I would be in favor of this. Commissioner McKay. A number of people spoke today said that they talked about the noise, but they didn't know where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. If they've been having events already here, and they don't, and they haven't created a problem. That's why I asked the question earlier: Can they still continue to do their business? Well, if they build a building, then they've got to go through the proper process of getting the, re right. the plat to ground and, and and to get drainage plans and everything to go with it. So, I'll be I'll be supporting the motion also. And I I live in the county on the other side, and we had a vacant ten acre lot, and the uh, illegal dumping was actually causing a devaluing of property around because it wasn't maintained, monitored, there was no staff and no. So I think there's there are some benefits because of a well put together plan um, and the structure that now the business would have to. So I would also be in favor. Any other discussion at this time? And I, you know, I, I'll just uh, say that I, I did like uh, looking over the contract here. It looks pretty thorough, even to the point of having uh, professional paid staff uh, on site whenever they're having an event. So I, 
the planning process will uh, answer a lot of the concerns and issues uh, for item number four on the on the hit list of things that we need to uh, verify our motion. Any other discussion? I would call for a roll call vote for the motion on the table to approve the application, recognizing that there is relative the removal of restrictions or the addition of restrictions. Just Why don't you try a voice vote to start with? Pardon me? Why don't you try a voice vote? Oh, voice vote. vote to start. Okay. Quick question. I uh, yes. just want to make sure we know who is the second on the was Commissioner Green. Warren. Thank you. Warren first and then Green. Warren and second. then Green. Warren and then Green. Go Green. I do. Even when you don't wear green shirts. And that, yeah. Glasses. Um, okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. The motion passes 12-0, 13-0. Thank you. Um, now Commissioner McKay is departing, so we're now at 12 members present. We'll move on to item 4.2. CUP 2022. 0052 at 127th Street East and north of Highway 54. Uh, Christina Reith, please present. Thank you. Christina Reith, Associate Planner with the Metropolitan Area Planning Department. Uh, this is case number CUP 2022 0052. We have Ronald M. Watkins and Melissa R. Watkins Revocable Living Trust as the applicants. Uh, we have the agents here today with the Boffman Company, and I believe the contract purchaser, uh, Margaret Bloom with Unit Union Development Holdings LLC is online. This is a minor amendment to the Meadowland Community Unit Plan, CUP DP 248, to permit the development of multifamily housing. The property is zoned GC General Commercial and is generally located on the east side of 127th Street, approximately one quarter mile north of US Highway 54. And it's, uh, if you look at the aerial here, it's in the, um, it's what's in this triangle. So the applicant seeks to develop multi-family uh, multi housing on parcel two. And in order to do that, um, they're applying to change the proposed uses to add um, all uses allowed I'm sorry. Yeah. I want to just pause for a moment. Do we have anyone chambers who wants to hear this case or make testimony on this case? Mr. Hartman, did you have questions on the case that we could address with staff directly? Uh, you didn't, you asked to hear this case, so your questions have been answered? Oh, okay. Do, did you want to ask some specific questions to direct the presentation? Okay, um, we can okay. skip Go, forward. Press, to, proceed. Go ahead. We can skip forward to the, to the site plans. Um, I know I'm supposed to use the mouse here. Or it's not working. Okay. So let's, um, let's skip to the... Um, do you have the elevation drawings up, Paul, please? Okay, so this is an aerial of the uh, multifamily units that they're proposing. Um, the contractor, contract purchaser seeks to build 240 units of multifamily housing, which will include 56 one-bedroom apartments, 48 two-bedroom apartments, and 24 three-bedroom apartments in one building. And the other building will have 36 one-bedroom apartments, 52 two-bedroom apartments, and 24 three-bedroom apartments. Um, so the site will also feature a community area with a fitness center, a media center, a business and computer learning center, an outdoor gazebo, a playground with a dog play area, a walking path, picnic areas, landscaping, and open space. Could we go to the next slide, please? And so here are the um, schematic drawings of the proposed uh, multifamily housing there. Shall I continue with the report, or did you have any additional questions? Are they asking for an increase in height, building height? 
Um, yes, from 35 feet to 50 feet, but this is still what it, less than what is permitted in GC general commercial zoning. So the CUP currently requires um, or allows up to 35 feet. They're asking for a building increase to 50 feet. Okay, I'm okay with it. You don't need to go any farther if you don't want to. Okay. <laughs> Did we have anyone participating virtually who wanted to present public comment on this case? Okay. Are there any other commissioner questions for staff on the case? I just want to see Phil having to go up there and make a presentation. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I do have <laughs> questions for Phil because he sat here a long time and wants to be asked some questions. Phil, considering that they're hoping to serve a population with 60% of AMI, um, can you tell me how the, how, where the nearest grocery store is to this area that has fresh fruits and vegetables? Do you have any idea? Because that's an asset for this type of client that's pretty important. And I see that there's also no public transit. Yeah, the, the uh, west side guy that lives on the west side of town is thinking about it's that good. question for it's a moment. A Walmart. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the Walmart, Walmart the Kellogg, would be the Green closest. Is close. Okay. Um, okay. And do you know if there's plans for on-site management of a complex with the, that's this dense? So Margaret Bloom is online with us. Margaret, it's been a long day waiting for this, and she's only got till five before she has to disappear. Can and you we appreciate you hanging with us. So Answer just how I'm. You do on-site, Margaret. Sure. Uh, yeah, we will have a uh, leasing office there. And there will be on-site property management, definitely. 24 hours or just during business operating hours? No, uh, probably a little longer than typical business operating hours, but not 24 hours. And will there be security on this location? There, there, will, be, there will be security cameras, secured access, that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Any questions for the applicant from the remainder of the commission? And then last call, any public comment on this case? Thank you case. for the afternoon of fun. All right. <laughs> you need to know what's coming down the pike, Phil. Uh, bring it back to the commission for action. Move we approve uh, for staff comment. Second. Motion from Commissioner Green, second from Commissioner Duell. Any discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, nay? Uh, motion passes 12-0. Next case, zoning case. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for hanging with us and being present to answer our questions. Zoning case 2022 63 63rd Street South in Clifton. Uh, Chris, and I believe, Commissioner Hartman, you asked to hear this case also? Uh, yeah, I was concerned about how much area was in the floodplain. Okay, yeah. can you speak to that aspect of the case? Um, why don't you, Christina, are you fine with that? Yeah, As our it's engineer a, it's can a, it's probably, a report. okay. Yes, it's all right. right. It is in the staff report, but. Yes. Um, so the applicant is requesting a zone change from SF5 single family residential district to TF3 two family residential district. Um, the subject site is generally located north of East 63rd. 63rd Street South on the east side of South Clifton Avenue. The subject site is currently undeveloped and the applicant proposes to build duplexes on site. Uh, I want to clarify here that on December 1st, um, so earlier this month, the property was annexed into the city of Wichita and the zoning changed from RR Rural Residential and SF20 Single Family Residential to SF5 Single Family Residential District. Um, I will just say that the general area, as you can tell, is mostly undeveloped, although on um, the west side of South Clifton Avenue, there is a uh, couple single family residences um, within uh, both the city of Wichita and unincorporated Sedgwick County. Um, based on the information available at the time the staff report was completed, staff recommends approval of the zone change request. And with that, I will stand for questions. Okay. So we have a question about the floodplain. And you'll defer to our applicant for the response to that question. Thank you. Good afternoon. Rebecca Amen. Mil oh. Okay. <laughs> Rebecca Millius, PEC 303 South Topeka, agent for the applicant. Um, as you can see on the map, obviously the area in blue here is listed as A, 
or AE. In this case, it is A. It's an unstudied floodplain, um, unstudied until we started touching it. We have spent an extensive amount of time actually studying um, the floodplain that impacts our property as well as the two different studies that were previously done either side of Clifton and 63rd. Um, I will tell you our CLOMAR, which is the conditional letter of map revision, has been filed with FEMA and approved in email, but not formal writing. So I don't have my approval letter yet, but I'm darn close, um, which grants us the ability to fill in the floodplain. So we have developed a drainage study that uh, shows the areas where we will be able to raise um, out of the floodplain. We will be offset, offsetting that um, in drainage reserves with our plat that you will see in the coming weeks. Um, in those reserve areas. And so all of those homes will be out of the floodplain as shown. Do you know how many net acres you're gonna end up with? Net acres of development, uh, approximately 39. But that's from, so keep in mind, mind you, this property goes up to this line over here as well as down this direction. We are only rezoning the area that will be uh, developed into duplexes. We do have proposed single family residential on the other side of the proposed drainage way. So in total, the plat will be approximately that 39 acres. Uh, the 14 acres is duplex only. But you are planning on uh, developing the whole 14 acres? Correct. Yes. All, all 14 acres of duplex zoning will be developed into duplexes. The, the parcel itself is approximately 55 acres um, from what is owned Again, this zone change application is just for that that's going to be converted to the duplexes. But I'm happy to answer any other specifics. Any other questions from the commission for the applicant? All right. Uh, public comment on this case. Anyone who wants to speak on this case? Anyone on participating virtually who would like to speak on this case? OK, hearing none. We'll bring it back to the commission. Move to approve. I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Warren. Second. Second from Commissioner Foster. Any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion passes 12-0. And I believe, didn't we approve 4.4? No, okay, we're hearing 4.4. Okay, very good. In uh, honor okay. of the gentleman who get the award for the day. Yes, the award for the all day. Of this for hanging educational with us. experience to hear the case they're interested in. For the record, right. Philip Ziebenbergen with the planning department. Zone 2264 is a application to rezone approximately eight and a half acres from single family residential to LI limited industrial. The property is located on the um, west side of South Hydraulic, about a quarter mile south of East 55th Street North. It is worth noting that a little over a year ago in 2021, this application, same application, was ultimately denied by City Council. This board did consider it. They recommended approval. The District Advisory Board 3 for City Council District 3 recommended denial. Um, and it was, again, ultimately denied by City Council. The zoning code does allow for the submittal of the same application after 12 months from the original public hearing. Um, and that those conditions have been met. So this is, in a sense, a rehearing of a same application from over a year ago. Um, the conditions are the same. Uh, the uh, proposed protective overlay uh, is the same. I'll go in some general detail of the report. As you can see here, the, the um, applicant, which is Phillips Southern Electric, they own the greater uh, 9.75 acre property. A portion of that property fronting hydraulic is already zone limited industrial. They're looking to rezone the remainder of the property. This is to allow for the opportunity to move and possibly expand their current operation in Wichita. Uh, they could accomplish this with general commercial zoning and not necessarily need limited industrial zoning to get the use. The difference is in general commercial manufacturing or machine shop requires uh, that the frontage along um, the uh, main street be for offices, retail, display, things of that nature. At this time, they're not sure if the office component of their business would be moving to this location. And so that is the reason why they're asking for the higher zoning of LI uh, to give them the leeway in order to move what they can, um, even if it's just the machine shop out to this location. 
As you can see on the uh, zoning map in front of you, properties to the north, west, and south are zoned single-family residential. Um, the properties just to the west have single-family residences on them on South Patty and East uh, 57th Street. Uh, there is a single-family home across the street on the east side. The properties on the east, this purple square here is unrestricted limited industrial, so there's no protective overlay. There's no restrictions on the types of uses they can do. Uh, the general commercial and limited commercial uh, zoning north of that does have a CUP on it, which do restrict the uses. There's a public park located in there. The majority of this parcel here is undeveloped. Paul, can you go to the aerial, please? The property is bounded on the north and west sides with um, some existing trees. Um, there's uh, some trees also on the south property line. If this is approved, this applicant will have to uh, come into compliance with the screening requirement, which requires a six-foot solid screening fence at a minimum on all sides that abut single-family residential zoning. In addition, because it's in the city of Wichita, the landscape requirement comes into play, which is one tree per 40 linear feet. One of the aspects of the protective overlay is that on the westernmost property line that that landscaping be increased to one and a half times the standard, which is uh, one tree per 30 linear feet. In addition, staff is recommending that the westernmost 200 feet of the property be restricted from no industrial uses. They can use that area for parking, um, but buildings or outdoor storage or anything like that cannot be within the west 200 feet, and that's in response to the location and proximity of those residential uses to the west. <clears throat> The community investments plan, if you want to land use map, Paul, this was a tricky case. The majority of the property is um, identified for um, vacant or agricultural use. There's a portion of the property that's identified for residential use. And then there's a portion of the property that's identified for industrial use. And so what you have is some inherent conflict with the land use map of you have some part of the property says you can do your industrial uses on it immediately abutting what is recommending for residential uses and so that inherently causes conflict um, so when we look at that we look at what are how can we mitigate this or how is there like a step down effect knowing industrial zoning does not allow for residential uses um, so you could have industrial uses in the industrial area that's already zoned that way and then the comp plan calls for residential uses next door and those don't really jive um, very well together which is why we have the protective overlay having mitigating factors for the properties to the west. And so what we looked at is, again, the property across the street is uh, zoned unrestricted and limited industrial. Farther to the east is the um, city of Wichita sewage plant. Uh, and so we're looking at, well, if there could be higher intensity uses across the street, what type of a step down fashion can we have to um, minimize the impact of the use on the current property to step it down to the lower residential uses to the west. Scott, do you want to yeah, jump just, in? Uh, Philip, in, in terms of the timing, how about, do you want to just cover what the recommendation Correct. is and we'll sure. see if there's any questions. Okay. No. So our recommendation overall is approval subject to the protective overlay, which is number 400. I'll um, hit some high points. Uh, number one, we're restricting some of the uses in limited industrial to avoid uh, some of the higher intensity uses that limited industrial would allow. Um, at the time of platting, this property will need to be platted. Um, East 57th Street is a street stub on the west-hand side. Uh, at the time of platting, the PO recommends or would require the access control be um, put on that East 57th Street to avoid any vehicular traffic from the subject site using East 57th Street and South Patty to get out. Um, it could be determined at that time whether it's a full closure or if it's for emergency purposes. But again, at the time of platting, no vehicular access on the west side. Um, we talked about the screening requirement, the compatibility, height and setback supply. We talked about the landscape buffer and how the west property line would have to have an increase in landscaping above and beyond what's required. And finally, the, uh, um, a big one is the west 200 feet of the site being restricted um, to not have any industrial uses, but can be used for off-street parking. There are some other conditions I did not cover there in your staff report and answer any specific questions about that. I have received public comment, but we have individuals in the room with us and I'll save um, it for them. They, apparently I set myself a time limit. Um, 
This has gone to the district advisory board on December 7th. They voted recommendation for approval, 601. Um, as you all know, uh, Cindy Miles, a uh, member of this board, sits on that board as well, and so she abstains from her district advisory board votes. That's where the abstention came from. With that, I can stand for questions. This was declined in the previous year when it was presented. Can you tell us what, was there any difference this time to that that yes. made the difference? My understanding, um, Scott presented on my behalf that day because I had no voice. Uh, the difference was at the district advisory board, this time the applicant and agent was there to speak to the advisory board. A year ago, uh, they were not present at the advisory board. Um, that, that is one of the major differences, not being at the advisory board this year. I can't really comment on the difference in conversation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, the applicant or agent, uh, will you please come forward to present your case? Okay. They're online. Uh, will you please state your name and address, please, and tell us a bit about your project? Are you still there? Let me, I got Young and Associates and Jason Phillips here that I see online. If you guys are yes. still with us. Hi, this is Kai Hudgens with Young and Associates. Um, we have uh, on our side, uh, no further comment. I don't know, Jason, if you have anything to, to put in. Yeah, this is Jason with Phillips Southern Electric. Uh, our address is 650 East Gilbert, Wichita, Kansas. Um, we appreciate your consideration on our behalf. We had purchased this property a few years ago. Uh, and over the past few years, uh, we have done our part to help clean up and improve the property. Uh, and we want to utilize it to the best use possible for our group and the, uh, the local area. Um, I think the easiest way for us to, to proceed is, is, is try to get the whole property zoned, the light industrial, like the front two acres, just to, to give continuity throughout. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, obviously, we'll be able to meet whatever considerations and requirements uh, set forth uh, by Mr. Philip Zettenberg. And so uh, that's all we have and uh, open to any other questions. Are you in agreement with staff comments for the items to be addressed as you proceed? Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, then we call forward for public comment. Please come to the microphone and state your name and address, please. And thank you for bearing with this long meeting. We appreciate it. The agenda is very, The know, fight's worth it, I promise you that. <laughs> so my name is Darren Rader. Uh, I live at 1301 East 57th, which is just adjacent to this property. Uh, I bought this property years ago uh, because there was nothing commercial around it. Uh, it. Now they're wanting to go industrial. We built a $500,000 house next to this property. You put industrial right next to it, and I lose a tremendous amount of value. Uh, I mean, that's that's the whole reason I built there is because it was single family next to us. If they want to put in houses, I have no objection to that. But to come in and put commercial vehicles and industrial vehicles right up next to my house, I mean, that's going to tremendously, it's a detrimental to to my property values, first of all. Second of all, uh, since they've bought this property, with them being a utility contractor, I have personally seen and have evidence of them drilling holes and putting contaminants in the ground. Uh, that's a huge thing. I'm only on, sit on well water. I have no access to city water. Ground contamination is very, very big in that area. I mean, we don't have it yet, but if, if my next door neighbor is doing it, then, I, then I'm not far from losing water. So they also have, have an employee of their company that has gained access to the property north of, of 55th, which also now works for, which is a subcontractor for this company, and they have started dumping on their ground as well. So, I mean, in this neighborhood, what, where do we stop if we're getting contaminated all the way around us? I mean, all of us in the neighborhood are, have fought it last year. We're fighting it again this year. I mean, we just don't know what to do and where to stop. So we ask that you deny this again this year. Questions for the speaker? 
Have you reported the dumping to yes, officials and very much so. Okay. Any other questions for the speaker, Commissioner Warren? And the response to your complaints? <laughs> we didn't get very far. You know, I mean, I, I I went as far as I could, as far as I know how. I'm just an individual. Uh, I think that's why they got denied last year is because of the complaints that I made. Uh, the neighbors are ecstatic that they got denied last year. Uh, you know, ju not just the dumping. He he made a comment that he that he cleaned it up. Yeah, well, we get we talked to his employees and they got they got a notice to clean it up from the city. So they've done nothing except for just just recently. So, you know, I don't know how. It, Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Next speaker. Go ahead to the com go ahead to add your comment, please, and give us your name and address for the record, please. Yeah, my name is Chuck Vitito. I live at fifty seven thirty Patty, just across the street from Darren. And uh, the big thing to me. It's like the property value, I've got an acre down there. We've been there for 25 years. And uh, if he starts putting equipment in there and backs up next to my property, you know, my property value is going to go down. So, and there again, you've got the, the uh, well pollution. It's only a matter of time. We're, our water is only about 20 foot deep. So that is my main concern, and that's why I'm asking you to deny the because, you know, I just would, there, there's just no sense to have all that. Whatever he's going to park over there, we don't even know yet. You're aware that they're recommending that the parking area for the industrial vehicles, is that correct, would be on the opposite side of the property, so giving a buffer zone. Can you remind us of that buffer zone? Um, The, I, I should have clarified the parking that's permitted in the west is for the off street parking for like employees, employees or staff. And the buffering for that, can you explain the buffering again, Philip? Or the uh, like landscape buffering or other buffering that's being rec would right, be so required? Right, so the requirement of the six foot screening fence that's just because of commercial next to residential that applies to anything limited commercial or higher. Uh, or I guess there's an, um, retail zoning stuff. And then the um, um, landscape requirement of the additional landscaping that's required on the western property line. Okay. Was there a 200 foot setback for something? Yes, yes the west 200 yes. feet, no industrial uses. Um, the west 200 feet can be used for off street parking. It's on, it's on page five of the staff report, and it is number seven. Yep. And it, it's that no outdoor storage or work area shall be permitted in any building setback, compatibility setback, or the west 200 feet. But it, this area can be used. Oh, and number six, no portion of any building or outdoor storage may occupy the west 200 feet. It can be used for the off-street parking. So the comment about work trucks parking right. in this area, that would be permitted. So where they're talking about parking is right Right behind it, just the cul-de-sac is a cul-de-sac ends right there. So their property starts probably what, maybe 50, 75 feet to the their property line. So that'll be backed hey. up next to my house, Darren's house, and we have a question, I believe, up here. Now that we got the aerial up. Can you show us where your properties are at? Uh, and you can use the mouse at the podium. Use the at the at the. So it's right here. Mine's here and his is here. Okay, what what is that to the to the left? Clear to the left. This here? No, keep keep going. This keep here? going. Right uh, and then uh, up. What's all that? This is a trailer park. Do you know what they were dumping over there? Or uh, just judging off of what they are and what they do. So yeah, can you? Yeah, will you state your? We haven't heard from you. Directly, so you go to the podium and give us your name and address, and then I was up here first. Oh, golly! But I'm a, I'm assuming I'm being directed. Long a day. Yeah, you're being directed a question, so I'll allow you to answer. So, yes. so judging off of what this company does is they do uh, uh, utility work, so they change out light poles. So they're 
what they do is they jet the ground and, and the creosodes and everything off the light poles is what I've, you know, just assumed because of what they do. Do I have firsthand knowledge of what they're dumping? Uh, I don't, but I mean, when you got to dig a hole to dump it in the ground, that's, <laughs> that's very alarming. You know, they already have the, the equipment to do so. Now they're, you know, they're, they're doing it in, so they've get been caught doing it right up here in the front part of their, their property. You know, now we're going to allow them to come clear back next to mine. Then it's going to allow them to do groundwater. So the property that the, their subcontractor zone is right here at the end of the block. And like I said, I have evidence of, of the dumping on both properties. All right. Thank you for responding. Uh, we have another what's question. The, what's the property just to the south of you? What? Do you that, that's a vacant, uh, it's, it's just wildlife area. I mean, it's, it's owned by an individual. Where does, where does he get access? Uh, they actually have access. So that you talked about this here area. So they have access through this front lot that they sold off here. That when they sold this off that they are granted access to their remaining because they have the eight acres here all the way to the interstate. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for our speakers? Commissioner Blick? Uh, from your input and where your property line is, which way is uh, the water runoff? Does it go south or does it go towards the west or to the east? from your property right now? It's pretty flat. Okay. Uh, I mean, I no. but but you can see that this this is the water drainage. This is a, this a, like a spillway, which is within 200 feet of their property. If, I mean, they're going to contaminate everything that's running into our city. This runs right down into the waste treatment plant. So groundwater is at 10 feet. Our wells are at 20. Any additional questions? Is there anyone participating virtually who would like to speak on this item? Then I would uh, return to our applicant for rebuttal to the comments we've just heard, please. You have two minutes to respond. Oh, and I'm sorry. You ha you're the one who hasn't had a chance to speak yet. Do you have additional information or concerns to present? Please approach the podium. Um, excuse me, applicant, we have one more speaker, so. My name is Kenneth Harper. I also live at 1301 East 57th Street South. One of the things I wanted to point out to you, not only is the, that's been pointed out, I realize this, uh, the well water is important because we're in an older neighborhood. Some people may have city water, but most don't. And even going south where I live down at 61st Street, most all those people have at least access to a city water, but many of them don't have it. However, one of the important things that I'm concerned about is, additionally, is we are in an all septic area. Nobody's hooked to the city sewers, to my knowledge, south of 55th right in there, and down in around 61st Street stuff where I used to live. You're turning this into a large commercial area. Do they have to have a, a big... Uh, what do you call it, pool, uh, because there's certainly, I can't imagine them having a septic tank big enough to work on a commercial building and access uh, 200 feet. I don't know what their uh, projection is as far as number of employees or things of this nature, so I have nothing against the people that own it or anything like that. I'm very concerned whether just their human waste and things of that, where is it going to go? Uh, it's got to go somewhere. Uh, so please keep that in mind, and you have more access than we have to determine whether that is hooked up to city waste. Uh, so that's all I wanted to add for that. Okay, thank you. Thank Any you. questions for the speaker? Then uh, we would call again now on the applicant to respond to the concerns that have been expressed, and you have two minutes. Yeah, this is Jason Phillips again, and uh, we appreciate the concerns of our neighbors down there around this property. Um, I do want to reassure and confirm that we have worked with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and have proven there has not been any illegal dumping of hazardous waste or anything of that kind on this property since we've owned it. 
Um, we've worked with Stacy Ballman on a number of occasions because there was concern of dumping, which was affirmed as solid waste as uh, spoils, dirt spoils, hauling in fill dirt. Um, at that point, we were not issued any citation, any limitation, uh, or having uh, obviously any issues with that. So, uh, outside of any any other issues, uh, there there is there is not any any waste being dumped. If somebody has been dumping, we have no subcontractors that are down there utilizing this yard. So there may be illegal dumping that we're not aware of. We do have this facility secured. So at that point, uh, that's all we have to say on that note. Back to cleaning up the facility. We bought it two and a half, three years ago. It was in, it was in pretty poor condition. There was uh, overgrown trees, dilapidated buildings, trash, waste. Uh, and we have been working with MABCD to get that rectified. Um, and it's, it was a pretty tall undertaking. We've got that completed. We've been working with Beth Ann Nordic and she uh, has, has been completely satisfied with all the work that we have been done. Uh, and at this point we're in great compliance. Um, and real quick with uh, access to utilities, drainage and water, we will get, be able to gain sewer and water, storm sewer facilities off of hydraulics. So that should not implement any of the neighboring properties with any storm water drainage uh, issues with septic or offsite facilities or any, et cetera. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions for the applicant? If not, I'll bring it back to the commission. What's your pleasure? And I do need to note, uh, Hugh Nix left before the beginning of this presentation and Bill Johnson has just left, so we're down to 10, I believe, voting on this case. Move to approve per staff comments. I have a motion from Commissioner Foster. Second. Second from Commissioner Duell. Any further discussion? It looks like most of the concerns aren't related to the zoning. It's other issues uh, like the water and stuff like that. So as far as zoning goes, I'm in agreement with that. Okay. Any other discussion? I'll call for a vote then. All in favor of accepting the proposal, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. And we encourage you to continue speaking to your neighbors if you see things so that they can address them. Thanks for your patience in attending today, too. Appreciate that. Ten. Ten zero. Yes, motion passed ten zero. Anything else? Are we adjourned? I believe our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for your participation. And, this uh, conference Mary is Christmas no longer uh, being recorded. And thank you for the chocolate and for your patience with our processes. And thank you all.